Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August 24, 2020 Westminster City Council meeting. At this time, I would ask you please to, wherever you're at, to take a moment and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. We thank you. Ms. Parker, would you be kind enough to take the roll, please? Certainly. Mayor Atchison. Here. Councillor DeMont. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Here. Councillor Seymour. Here. Councillor Scully. Councillor Smith. Here. And Councillor Bowles. Here. All right, thank you everyone. First item on our agenda is item 3A. This is the minutes of the August 10th and August 17th meeting. Ms. Scully. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the City Council approve the minutes of the August 10th, 2020 and August 17th, 2020 meetings as presented. Mr. DeMott? Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion to accept the voice on the meeting minutes of August the 10th and August 17th, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion is carried. Before I open up the next item, uh, I want to real quick to go to the council and see if there's anything coming up on item 8A that any council member wishes to have removed from the consent agenda before we get there. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you read my mind. I was actually typing in that I would like to remove the financial report from the consent agenda. Okay. Any items on item B? All right, hearing none, we'll move on then. The next item is uh, item four is presentations. Uh, we have none tonight. Ms. Parker, I understand we have uh, several comments, both uh, written and recorded. Can you that is, uh, advise us what we have, please? Yes, that is correct, Mr. Mayor. Um, two written comments were submitted in advance and have been forwarded to city council um, as well as included in the packet that is posted on our website for the public to view. Those comments came from Charlie Lander and from Ellen Buckley. In addition, we have six voicemail recorded comments that were left by members of the public. And at this time, Matt Williams will play those back just to very quickly for the record, um, give you the names. There were two that did not state their name during the message. We contacted them with their phone numbers. Um, to get their names for the record. And uh, those were speakers number four and five, Sandra Capron and Don Nordland. Uh, and at this time, we will play back those six messages for council. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Elisa Wisenand. I live in uh, Westminster. And um, the topic I wanted to bring up was concerning the car racing and motorcycle racing on US 36 anytime between 11 p.m. and early morning, like 1 a.m. Um, I, I understand that the police have been uh, working on it, uh, but it still continues like at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning. And um, I think uh, me as well as other residents are not able to get sleep and we're not able to have our windows open uh, I was wondering um, what city council can do about it. Uh, I was wondering if a noise ordinance can be uh, put in place and how to do that. Um, if you need to, you can contact me uh, at 303-594-4750. Thank you very much. What 
what is the city going to do about this big increase in our water bill? I'm a widow, senior citizen. I cannot handle this big water bill. Something must be done. And I believe I said my name is Vaughn DeCrow and I'm at 6651 West 72nd Drive. We have hired lawn doctor to help us get our yard looking decent and it needs water. And we're going to have to cut it back. We are very careful with our water usage with limiting our showers, dishwasher, laundry, only making full loads, what have you. Um, it's very, very disappointing. There are two people that live in our household and my water bill almost tripled. Thank you. Hi, this is Jessica True calling. I'm a homeowner in Westminster. And I'm calling regarding the meeting tonight. Um, the first point I want to make is that I am not in favor of renewing Donald Trump's contract. I feel that his lack of uh, management and leadership during the pandemic just shows what we already knew, which is that he's not qualified and capable of taking on the task of running our city. As manager, he did not furlough anyone. He hasn't saved us any money uh, during the past six months. And as every other city has, has undertaken these cuts, we have not, and now we find out we have an 18 to $32 million deficit. I wonder why. Number two, I am not in favor of hiring a consultant for 10,000 of our hard earned tax dollars so that people on the council can learn to talk to each other and communicate professionally or whatever the problem is. You know, if you don't want to hear the truth, then you should resign off the council. People, People uh, know that, that there's a bunch of people on this council that should be recalled for their um, lack of leadership, lack of listening to the constituents, um, lack of even reading, doing their own research and fact checking what these staff, these staff who honestly should mostly be fired have presented as facts to them. If, for example, our water bill in, in Westminster, when I went and verified this, we have the second highest water bills in the country for cities between 100 and 200,000 people. And that is a fact. We have higher water bills than Flint, Michigan, and they are rebuilding their entire infrastructure. So it's completely wrong to say that this is affordable. If it was affordable, then everyone would be charging that. So it's the highest in our area. It's the highest, second highest in the country. And this is just, this is just wrong. And UNESCO and the UN have a standard of what you should be paying for water. Water is a human right. And the fact that they've decided, you've decided to charge these egregious rates when 33,000 residential accounts use 60% of the water, but 3,700 accounts use uh, these wholesale and commercial accounts use, use another 40%. That doesn't even count, I think, what the city is using. I see the city has had no problem watering the heck out of all these parks that people are avoiding because they don't want to catch COVID in them. And meanwhile, all my neighbors who are on fixed incomes can't afford to water their lawns and everything is dying, including our mature trees. It's a travesty. And we're going to do a recall of uh, Atchison site, Gully, and I'm sorry, I don't know how to say the last name, uh, but he's being recalled too. And if you, don't think we're serious, then watch the news tonight. This is a serious matter. You're depriving the citizens here of, of the ability to, to pay for food and groceries uh, and medication and other utilities with these high prices. It's, it's wrong. It's not in line with pricing anywhere else in the country. And you're, you know the voters are gonna have their say about this. So um, I am just, it's a scandal. You know, it's a scandal and we also want an audit of the water department. And if you think you're so great at con conservation, this is about conservation, then show us how you're using the water. So be transparent, do a pie chart that shows the city's use of water per square foot. Do a pie chart that shows where these commercial properties and wholesale properties are using water. I was at Legacy Ridge yesterday. They don't seem like they're, they're short on water on that golf course. So, you know, all these giveaways that you're giving, the business and developers, these are going to stop and we're going to do an audit. I mean, sooner or later, there's going to be an audit of a lot of the decisions that were made by the council and by the uh, the staff. And, you know, frankly, 
Good luck on not going to jail because what you're doing is wrong, frankly. It's wrong. Lying to the public is wrong. It's not just incompetent, it's criminal. Yes, hello, I've been a Westminster resident for 24 years now. Always really happy to be a Westminster resident, but uh, these water rates are personally impacting my life and many of my neighbors. And I wondered when you made this decision to give us these absorbent rates, whether you consider the human factor in this. Uh, neighbors, that's all they talk about is how high their water bill is. A lot of my neighbors are elderly. They're so distraught over this. This is, we are the second highest in the nation for water rates. And I really don't really care about how much building you want to do. You need to consider your residents your faithful residents and how this is financially impacting them personally. My husband and I, he's going to retire next year. We have a half acre lot and our water bill will be six to seven to $800. That is not a 10% increase. And the tears are absolutely unacceptable. Please think about what you're doing to your residents. People that cannot afford to pay for their kid, their wa to water their lawns and for their kids to ha have laundry and baths. Thank God there's only two people in my house. I don't know what I would have done if I would have had my three children still living with me. I would have had to move. There's no way we could afford it, uh, this type of an increase. It is totally unacceptable. And please think about how absorbent these prices are and how you're impacting your residents in such a terrible way. Really think about it. There's no reason why anyone would want to move to Westminster. And I tell everybody I know, do not move to Westminster unless you want to pay absorbent water prices. Please give it some serious consideration. I would really appreciate that. Something has got to be done. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to call and officially make the complaint about the water rate. My parents are both retired and um, they didn't really water their lawn at all and they had a $300 water bill last month. We wish to please reconsider your rate. Thank you. Yes, this is Joe and Kathy Martinez. We're calling about our water bills being so high. Uh, I called out and the meter in our box was leaking and uh, we're on a fixed income and we're barely making ends meet as it is. Our temporary jobs are all because of the COBA and uh, we would like some help on lowering our water bills. We're uh, we called in and our usage is lower than it was last year. So we have been cutting back and trying to save money, but with the way you're handling business is impossible. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, that is all of the uh, recordings that we received for public comment at this time. Thank you, ma'am. Moving on to the next item. This is a report of city officials. Mr. Tripp. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, thank you for everyone who uh, sent in and uh, phoned in uh, public comment tonight. That's always very much appreciated. I want you to know we're, we hear you and we're listening. Um, for those that had questions this evening, um, staff will be following up with you to see uh, if there's something that uh, we can do to serve you. Um, many of the questions tonight were concerning water and uh, the public works utility staff and the building staff both have uh, ideas and, and information they can provide to you. There's a lot of information on the city's website, of course, too, and you probably are aware of that. Uh, it pains me to hear those, those stories, um, frankly. Um, we really do empathize with it. Um, we will follow up and uh, see if there's something that we can do to provide advice to you as to how to get your bills down. The bills are based on usage. Um, the other thing that I'd like to mention tonight is that I don't often mention particular specific events and activities, but I just want to point out 
with the Bay Balls program that was in Westminster uh, a week ago um, was really a tremendous get by our economic development and cultural affairs staff and Parks and Rec and economic development both. Um, it's uh, it's um, it was it was very heartening. Um, people are looking for things to do outdoors in particular. Uh, I drove down there to see um, the uh, the paintings that were done, the murals that were done in uh, uh, Harris Park around the TOD, um, the, the train station development in that area, and uh, they were beautiful, um, unbelievable talent, and uh, it was it was very very cool to see that in our city. So I want to point that out to the staff that uh, that brought this together, and, and that's all I have this evening, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to city council comments. The first person in the queue is Ms. Seitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, um, council. I uh, would agree with um, city manager Don Tripp. I really uh, appreciate having um, the different public comments tonight, um, both the recorded and the written. Um, that is when one of the shames of COVID is not being able to see our residents um, face to face um, when they want to discuss these concerns. So thanks for reaching out to us. Um, I did hear something, um, it, kind of a, a narrative that I wanted to see if staff would maybe take a moment to answer. Um, I've heard this today recently um, that we're the, the second highest in the nation for water rates and that we're the highest in Colorado. Could staff take a moment to answer? Is that in fact accurate? Ms. Seitz, we provided, we provided we an assessment. Hang Ms. on a second, Okay. Ms. Seitz, this is for your comments. This is not a back and forth period, recall. So uh, leave your question. We typically, we've typically been able to ask staff questions during our council comments, but I can defer and we can get the email um, because I don't believe, I think even based off of our own website, I don't believe that we're the highest in the, the state, but we have multiple times the seven years I've been on council been able to ask staff. Um, I will go on and give a quick update um, from the NADA Strategic Planning Commission meeting that I had last week. Um, the, with that meeting, um, we went through kind of the Smart Commute gave an update that there will be a trans forum on October 22nd. It's going to be virtual. Um, so they got a pro approval to go forward and, and it is going to be virtual. So that will be a change. Um, we also got an update on the RTD Accountability Committee. And as most of you remember, um, Councillor, or rather Mayor Pro Tem Mullica from North Glen was selected to be the North Area's representative. Um, and she is going to do an excellent job at that. Um, she has let us know it's her intention that at every um, SPC meeting, she will come forward and give us updates on what's going on with the Accountability Committee and ask for our feedback. So it's a really collaborative approach to um, this this committee um, in Westminster. Um, even though we didn't get a representative there, we'll still get a voice. Um, we also got some information um, update on RTD, um, starting with the GM search. I believe each of you saw I sent an email um, last week letting you know that there were three final candidates and a copy of, or a link rather, to their video um, kind of interviews. Um, and so, the, the three candidates were all excellent. They had um, a, a lot of different um, backgrounds and a lot to offer. Um, the decision will be made tomorrow night. Um, I think the, the time for input um, from the community had closed on Sunday evening, um, but I think we are gonna be in good shape regardless of which of the three women they choose. Um, I also wanted to let you know that they reimagine RTD process has been paused. Um, and I, I think there was a feeling that this is really a great thing. It'll allow it to work in tandem with the accountability committee um, and pause till after we, we know who the new um, GM is going to be. Um, RTD end line opening is still planning on going on, but RTD is not planning a specific event for it due to COVID. Um, so that is unfortunate, but at least it is uh, on schedule or on the new schedule. Um, and then there was a conversation um, a little bit um, at a, a recent um, planning uh, meeting for Boulder County. I believe it came up that there is the possibility to look at peak rail 
for fast tracks um, as instead of like a final corridor, just another segment of it. Um, and with that, there might be a way to re relook at the process um, for funding. And so um, there was some discussion, BNSF, as we know, and from the mayor's reports prior, um, for the engineering study to be completed, they would like to see some dedicated funding. And so there was some conversation about potentially could we um, ask RTD to have that FISA, that a, a, a account used for that funding. So it'll be interesting to see where that conversation leads. Um, and then finally, um, you know, obviously we had um, I-70 burning um, west in our state near uh, Grand Junction and Glenwood Springs. So some concerns about what that's going to do to the CDOT budget. Um, there were also some concerns about the level of commitment or um, likelihood of the I-25 corridor um, moving forward with some of that um, funding. So those are things for us to keep our eyes on. Um, but after that, I think that's all I have for that meeting. Mr. DeMott. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to take a minute to recognize an organization, Westminster Cares, that does a food bank in partnership with Tri-City Baptist Church. Um, this afternoon, they had their, their um, food drive that they try to do pretty often right now during COVID. And I know we have some other partners, but this is one that I think has been serving the community pretty well. Um, and I would encourage people, if you need those services and to you know make it from week to week they're a good organization and you can follow Westminster Cares on Facebook um, I also try to share whenever I see that they're going to have a food pantry day so a uh, good uh, resource in, in these times um, the second thing I wanted to mention was first you know like we heard with some prior speakers thank you to the people who took the time to reach out and leave messages and send in uh, feedback I also hear there's a fair amount of people at City Hall tonight that are um, in protest because of our water rates. Um, I know that a few years ago when we voted on the increase in water rates, I was very concerned about the water rates and I think it's no secret that I voted against them um, because I was concerned about how they were gonna impact our, our neighborhoods and our community. Um, we're second year of that in a very hot summer now and I think we're really seeing the impacts at probably the worst time possible with the economic downturn of COVID. So um, I just mentioned all that because I want people, I've heard from countless people over the last uh, few weeks, especially as it's gotten hotter, um, with concerns about their water rates, just like we've heard tonight. So, you know, I encourage that we continue those conversations. I know that we have a, if folks that are listening tonight don't know, um, we are looking at doing some different ways of communicating and going through some special meetings to talk about water rates. Um, I hope that those conversations are fruitful in us finding a different way to move forward because I, um, like some of the speakers we've heard, feel that that's what we're doing now is not sustainable for our residents. Um, the last thing I'd mention is, you know, I've been out in some of the neighborhoods walking with some candidates who are running during this election cycle, I've seen a lot of brown yards, I've seen a lot of dirt yards, and, you know, those were some of the concerns that were mentioned a few years ago and what we're hearing on the phone. So I think personally in my um, assertion, we can do better, and I hope that as a council we'll work to do so. Ms. Scully. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had a, a Jefferson County Economic Development meeting last week. Um, this was really just a, a meeting to kind of talk about how the communication will go forth from here. We have a new um, person who is our new CEO, um, and he really was just kind of getting us organized, making sure that um, we knew how to use the new computer system that will carry the minutes and the agendas. Um, so that was all that happened at that meeting. It, there really wasn't much more to it. We talked a little bit about the retreat coming up in September. And um, I just wanted to compliment the city. There are going to be new bike lanes on 88th going west between um, Harlan Street and Wadsworth. Um, I have been an avid bicyclist in our city for many years doing the trails and the bike lanes in the city on the main roads. Um, it can be a very um, terrifying ride if you can't find a good bike lane or a good bike route. So thank you very much to the work of our city for putting those um, bike lanes in. And I wanted to give a shout out to um, Animal Management Officer Janelle um, Cook, Coke, 
um, for um, she is on our Foothills Shelter ad this month. So congratulations and thanks for representing our city. Hi, Mr. Mayor. I think you called me. Um, you broke out there, but uh, just wanted to uh, give a few updates. Uh, the Historic Landmark Board uh, was set to meet on Wednesday, and uh, there wasn't much on the agenda, uh, so they're pivoting to a later time to meet. Uh, I believe it's November uh, that their next scheduled meeting is to be. Um, and then, uh, let's see here. Uh, much to what Mayor Pro Tem was saying about the end line opening, uh, I don't think she mentioned the date, which is September 21st. Um, and there will be RTD ambassadors at each, each station uh, handing out some information and welcoming patrons to the, the new line. Um, so I encourage everyone to come out and uh, check out the line. I believe the line uh, on that first day um, is free to the public. And then uh, much to coming into City Hall, um, I know that I feel like we're breaking a, a record here uh, again uh, that we say that we want to be in person, uh, but walking into City Hall uh, to set up for our meeting tonight, um, there were, I want to say at least 100 to 150 cars. The parking lot was full uh, coming in to for people protesting against our water rates. Um, so I wanted to thank those uh, that I were able to speak with uh, walking into our meeting that uh, you have a lot to say and we're, I'm listening. Um, and so I, it's, it's heartbreaking to hear that people have to choose to uh, water over food. Uh, and one of the constituents that I've talked to, um, she used to go to the rec center to her and her husband. They're on a, a retirement budget and they used to use the rec center uh, to help reduce their water costs and the rec center is not open. Uh, and so their bills are now, they're seeing that effect. Um, and so while this is unfortunate that we have a COVID, a COVID life right now um, on top of a uh, low water season for rain, um, it's just heartbreaking to see so many people um, and so many people hurting with our uh, rate structure. So um, again, I can't say this enough. I look forward to talking with staff and uh, working with my colleagues to really set a good policy moving forward as far as setting our water rates. And then lastly, um, I just started up my uh, CASA volunteer. Uh, again, I took my first case uh, since last year. Um, and we're really in need of uh, court appointed special advocates. Um, they are doing their, uh, you can meet virtually, you can um, get training virtually, but we are in dire need of a CASA volunteer for our kiddos um, in this time. So if you want more information uh, or would like to uh, be a volunteer, please reach out to me. Um, I just met with my kiddo today uh, and, and it's a different world. Um, so if you could, any in any capacity in our community volunteer, um, please do so. Thank you for the time. Mr. Seymour, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to recognize our special permits and licensing board that met this week, uh, this last week uh, virtually. And uh, while it is a tough business time, uh, they uh, approve some licenses for a couple uh, businesses here in Westminster. So that's good to see a uh, positive outlook. There are still businesses that are, are moving ahead uh, in this economy and will help us help us grow this next year. I too also like to, um, uh, again, as I, as I do almost weekly now, uh, uh, in looking at the no numbers on COVID for Jefferson and Tri-County Health Departments, uh, press forward on in-person meetings as uh, quickly as we can. Uh, staff presented us an excellent plan on how that was going to be working. And now uh, I'm looking forward to a date on those plans. Thank you. Any other comments before we move on to the consent agenda? All right, moving on to the next item of the consent agenda is a group of routine matters to be acted on with a single motion and vote. 
Uh, we've already determined we want to have item 8A, the financial report, removed from the consent agenda so that only leaves one item, item 8B. Mr. Bowles, if you would, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the City Council adopt the consent agenda item 8B. Mr. DeMott? Second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any questions from the Council on the one item that we have on the consent agenda, item 8B? If not, Ms. Parker, this is a roll call vote. We'll come back to item 8A in a moment. Mayor Ms. Atchison. Yes. Atchison votes yes. Councillor DeMott. Yes. DeMott votes yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Sites votes yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Seymour votes yes. Councillor Scully. Yes. Scully votes yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Smith votes yes. And Councillor Bowles. Yes. Bowles votes yes. All right, consent agenda item 8B carries on a 7-0 vote. Next item on the agenda would go back to item 8A. And do we have a motion to bring this to the table? Mr. DeMott? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to um, pass consent agenda 8A. And Mr. Voles. I second the motion. I have a motion and a second. We had a request to remove this, so Ms. Sykes, you had requested to remove it. Correct. Um, so I thought it might be beneficial for all residents listening in addition to council to get a brief a verbal summary of this report. I think that it's gonna be really important for us to communicate in as many ways possible um, what the financial position of the city is and how it has changed from what we've budgeted. Um, I have asked if um, Don Tripp, our city manager, would be comfortable um, asking one of his staff to just give us a very high level overview of this item. Again, just wanting to communicate this um, and make sure we're all absorbing the same information. Mr. Tripp. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, for the question. Uh, this is the city's uh, annual, or annual rather monthly financial report. And uh, uh, our deputy city manager, and who's also a, the chief financial officer of the city, Larry Dorr, is available to, uh, to give a short overview of that and uh, also to answer questions council may have about uh, this report. The report is contained on the city's website uh, under the documents with tonight's council meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tripp. Once again, Larry Dorr, Chief Financial Officer and Deputy City Manager. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for just a brief overview here tonight. And uh, may I just uh, first describe what's prepared? We have a typical monthly financial report of our uh, various fund activities across the city, but we've also prepared uh, now, uh, for a number of months, our COVID chronicle, which zeroes in on a number of different uh, financial issues, revenues, and expenditures related to the city's uh, impact from uh, COVID-19 and the economic uh, fallout of that. Um, I want to thank our finance department and sales tax division for all of the work that has gone into preparing these various reports. Of course, our policy and budget department uh, for comparing all of the records. And uh, we're also uh, tracking our strategic hiring freeze and our human resources department is tracking our uh, personnel uh, changes, vacancies, and all of our savings going into that. So just, a, just kind of a high level overview of what's reported is some 30 plus pages of financial data. And I know there's a lot of information there. I certainly uh, couldn't take the time here and in the meeting to go into detail, but I think there are a, a few bullet points that I would wanna make uh, city council and the public aware of uh, just as we walk through. First is the sales use tax uh, and uh, building use tax and motor vehicle use tax uh, that's reported here is for the month of June economics. 
uh, we collect our sales taxes in arrears a month after the economic activity happens. And of course, we tally up all of those receipts and make this report uh, uh, published for the city council. And, and we did see an easing in economic activity, slight improvement with this cracking of the valve. And, and so we weren't too surprised with the numbers, uh, a little bit more favorable that way. Uh, also, we saw uh, some really just excellent activity in our, our golf uh, enterprise. We had a significant record uh, turnout and activities uh, in our golf uh, revenue source. I want to make you aware of that. And then also uh, we had uh, some savings that's described in our COVID chronicle related to strategic hiring. We've uh, now as a result of this initiative conserved $1.3 million this year to date uh, and just for the month uh, that was reported $270,000. So those those things are all uh, yielding the savings that uh, uh, we need so significantly. Finally, uh, there is if there's one chart amongst the many uh, that I'd like to point everybody to is really this uh, sort of our cash change from month to month or what we're calling our cash burn rate. Uh, and uh, you see the chart uh, in the COVID Chronicle there and it catalogs uh, for the month of July a burn of $1.1 million for the month, uh, bringing the grand total uh, impact to $6 million. Now, I'll say that that's net of expenditure savings. That's net of the expenditure savings in strategic hiring and in uh, the closure of, of some of our uh, recreation centers and libraries. Those uh, trickle to the bottom line for a total impact thus far of $6 million. Uh, so I want to, I just want to point everyone's attention to that. It's something that we're watching very, very closely. Uh, we are collecting uh, this week and beginning Friday our July sales taxes that will be due uh, here at the uh, end of August. And we'll continue to provide the latest up-to-date information uh, to you, Mayor and City Council, and of course the public. Uh, the the opportunity for us to measure these revenues as economic activity uh, can hopefully uh, continue to improve will give us a better picture as we prepare our 2021 budget i will caution that uh, it could be expected that it, for the july collections that we're receiving right now that there could be a, a slight decrease in sales uh, activities we had uh, some liquor restrictions that were imposed by the state of colorado in terms of times of day uh, that things may be sold that could have impacted uh, economic output there. So I'll just uh, have a, a bit of caution uh, for our upcoming or for our next report, which will uh, include uh, our most recent collection. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm, I'm joined by our accounting division manager, Sherry Sanchez, uh, who is our acting finance director tonight. And we'd be happy to field any questions and hopefully we hit the mark in providing uh, just a general overview of those uh, points that uh, would be most interesting. Thank you. Ms. Seitz, you have another comment? I just, I did want to say thank you. This was very short notice to give the overview. Um, if my colleagues agree, I'm wondering if perhaps it might be beneficial um, each month as we receive the financial report to maybe pick a few different um, indicators, um, sales and use tax receipts, um, you know, a few different um, indicators to help um, and expenditures because that was one thing i was very impressed that some of our expenditures were were much lower as well um, but i think it might be incredibly relevant this is not going to be a typical budget cycle these are not typical financial reports and maybe um, we just don't keep them on the consent agenda but have a verbal update each month with month with them um, if my colleagues agree there might be value in that all right, other comments, Ms. Smith? Ms. Smith, you have uh, your name in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, one of the questions that I had was, let me, break, let me get to it. Um, Ms. Smith, we can't hear you. Talk to your mic, that might help. Can you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just pull up my question here. Um, it said one of the uh, contingencies on uh, the Jefferson County side for dollars spent need to be returned by September 1st, 2020. Um, any funds expected not to be spent um, will be go going back. Do we know or have any indication of how much is being returned? 
Well, thanks, Councillor Smith. Uh, this is Larry Dorr once again. Yes, I do have a bit of an update uh, later on tonight in your agenda uh, to just cover a number of things related to the Coronavirus Aid, Recovery and Economic Security Act. So uh, if it'd be okay, I'd be happy to just open up the questions to all of those. Uh, we don't intend to return any funds, if I may just answer that really quickly, but I'll give you a little update on the September 1st report that is to be filed and our spending year to date and a few other things related to CARES uh, a little bit further down the agenda. Okay, great. I'll hold off on my question. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Mr. DeMont, do you have a question? Um, comment first, I, I uh, like Mayor Pro Tem Site's idea of kind of trying to stay on top of this, not just have a consent agenda while we're going through this um, time of COVID and what's going to be a rough patch for a while. The other thing that I'm curious about is how, and I know we have the the COVID Chronicles that really goes in depth, but I really would like just kind of executive summary, maybe not this time, but going through because we've been given a pretty large range of where we think we might land in a um, shortfall of, you know, 18 to $32 million that we talked about on the budget weekend. So, you know, just as we go through this, if we could, you know, know how we're tracking against that range and if we think we're going to, you know, moving up the range or down the range, staying in the lower end of it. So I don't know if that's possible to kind of do as we go through the months of what, you know, what you're forecasting and how far out you're forecasting as well is something I don't really quite understand. So I don't know if that's something you could speak on now if you have any feedback, but I would like to kind of try to keep our thumb on that as much as possible as we go through the, you know, future months. Thanks so much. Yes, I appreciate the feedback. We'll certainly uh, be able to provide at least this level of an executive overview. I know it's a lot of information, but we uh, always are challenged to strike the right balance between transparency and providing information, but also just pointing, uh, hopefully, uh, folks to the most pertinent uh, of items. So absolutely, we'll continue to do that. And uh, point taken, we will also track uh, our revenue shortfall, expenditure savings, and then the net. I'm really focused on the net because that's our actual uh, impact to cash, but we'll continue to do that to going forward. And and as relates to uh, the forecasting, and we'll be update, updating that um, as we get more information, we'll certainly have a lot of, a lot of detail uh, for council and the public at our September 19th budget study session. Thank you. Mr. Voles. Yeah, thank you. I would uh, also, I, I agree with uh, Councilor DeMott, Mayor Pro Tem Sites. I think that's an excellent idea. So I would support that, particularly focusing on kind of what each month, what's the highlight? What's something that's just really unusual or unique or something and draw our attention to that? We can um, learn more about that, maybe in kind of in, in slices or in doses. I have a question about, it looks like we had a really, and you maybe already comment on this, so I apologize if I'm repeating something, maybe you already pointed out, but so retail sales kind of had a really significant jump in April and May, but then we saw end of June and then July do a precipitous drop, it looks like. What was the reason for that? Did you say earlier, what, why did we have, it looks like it's down to really small, like 1.9%, and in April we had like 14% growth. So what, uh, what caused the drop off, if I'm reading that right? Thank you, Councillor Voles. Uh, yes, I think you're looking in our COVID chronicle uh, on the I back know. couple at the back. Yes, at the last couple of pages. These are national retail sales. We're trying to uh, just give a picture, and that's percentage change from one month to the next. Uh, and very clearly, you know, due to the impacts of COVID, we had some significant drop-offs in percentage, as you see there, down 15%. Uh, but we did nationally, due to some of the unemployment stimulus and uh, things happening there see a bit of a bounce back. Uh, these are national trends and and you know to some degree they've mirrored what's happening in city of Westminster but there have been some departures as well. You know we just want to try to provide some uh, perspective uh, as to things that are happening across the country and as you put it uh, one or two data points of interest that we can kind of continue to track. So yes we have some also here some single family and multifamily residential new construction starts. We've presented that as well because you know that often can be an economic indicator of uh, demand for housing and and so forth. So we've we've added to the our COVID chronicle 
um, a bit of an economic dimension across the country. Uh, of course, our, our own retail sales in Westminster as re relates to sales tax. Uh, and uh, of course, we've got a bit of a CARES report and our cash burn. So it is, a, it is quite a, a wide uh, array of information. And I'll tell you that we're using this managerially across the organization as well as, a, as an internal and external tool for the, for the public. So yes, I, I think that was that initial uh, substantial uh, federal stimulus that uh, allowed people to uh, you know, immediately have some relief. But uh, obviously, there's been some lev leveling off since then across the country. Thank you for that answer. And I, I appreciate that. And thank you to all the staff who put together this um, <clears throat> COVID chronicle. It's, it's uh, good information. I really appreciate you taking the time, putting it together. And I appreciate just a little bit of an explanation for a few of the points. Do you happen to know, are, here in Westminster locally, are we also in that same uh, residential starts graph shows an uptick in June and July. Are we similar to that locally, or do you have a feel for that yet? Well, uh, for July, we won't. Uh, we're just now getting our cash receipts uh, for economic activity in July. And so uh, those are coming in as we speak. And we're seeing some continued trends. We're seeing a home improvement, of course, has been very, very strong. Uh, grocery uh, retailers uh, really having some very strong sales as well. Um, liquor outlets, quite honestly, we're starting to see some trends across that. Uh, but it's a real mix as to what's happening in retail across the whole country. But it's something we just, we just want to have an awareness of. I'm actually referring more to housing starts. You have a graph, multifamily residential starts. Um, it looks like housing, uh, housing data. Do we happen to know if the national trend meets or matches uh, just basically the same trend here in Westminster? Thank you, Councillor Voles. You know, I don't have in my uh, I don't have in my notes here just a, a real comment on what's happening right here in Westminster. Of course, I'd, I'd rely on some of my colleagues uh, across community development, but I can tell you uh, that our building construction use tax has uh, decreased significantly. That's a part of our uh, COVID report here. But uh, uh, maybe we need to uh, have, have an addition, and we'll make a comment on some of the starts that are happening across the city and or other permits as well relative to housing. Uh, dwelling units, uh, add-ons, whatever the case may be. So we'll have a little bit of a comment. Well, thank you. And I know it's kind of short order for you to, to jump in and answer questions on this right away, but uh, thank you for that. Thank you for the answers and all your work on this. I appreciate it. Are there other questions or comments in regard to the financial report for why? Seeing none, Ms. Parker, this will be a roll call vote for item 8A. Thank you. Councillor DeMont. Yes. DeMont votes yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Sites votes yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Seymour votes yes. Councillor Scully. Yes. Scully votes yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Smith votes yes. Councillor Bowles. Yes. Bowles votes yes. And Mayor Atchison. Yes. Atchison votes yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're moving on to item nine. We have no appointments or resignations tonight. Moving on to the first order of business, item 10 this is the public hearing and certification for the city's application for the Edward Byrne Memorial. So before I turn this over to uh, Council for any questions or open it up to the public. Chief Carlson, would you have someone from your department or yourself, either one, uh, that could let us know what this application is for and about? Certainly, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have uh, with me Deputy Chief Norm Hobbert, who would be uh, the one uh, implementing the funds for this grant and the purchase. So I'll turn it over to him and uh, let him explain what we're going to spend those funds on. Thank you, sir. Keith. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. That will allow us. Oh. All right, Mr. Hobart, guys, can you get on the line now? 
Yes, sir. Am I there? Yeah, you're there now. Go ahead. All right. Sorry. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, City Councilors, Norm Hobart, Deputy Police Chief, uh, Patrol Division. The grant would allow us to purchase uh, equipment that is currently unbudgeted. It is uh, for uh, cameras uh, that have LPR technology that would allow us uh, to put it into high crime areas, would also allow us to use the LPR technology in a format uh, for um, the uh, racing that is going on in 36 in different areas. Uh, the big piece of this, um, where it's different from our current technology, is it is portable, it is self-contained, and would not require us to plug into a uh, permanent power supply, if that makes sense. Okay, any other information you can provide for us, Chief? Is that pretty well it? I think that's uh, just a real good nutshell explanation of, of how we would spend the funds, uh, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. Uh, before I open it up to the public, are there questions from anybody on the council? I have uh, Councilor DeMott and Councilor Smith wanting to make the motion when we get there, but uh, before I open it up to the public, are there comments or questions? Mr. DeMott. Thank you, Mayor. I just would like to commend the police department on looking for these types of grants to be able to take care of the needs um, of the city and minimize um, taxpayer dollars so that we can spread them out further when it comes to these critical services. I, they mentioned a specific one that we heard a complaint about just tonight, which is the street racers. And I'm sure that my colleagues on council probably get just as many phone calls and emails as I do about the street racers as well as probably hear them. So um, I appreciate the efforts that are put in on this. And again, on us looking for ways to be able to stretch our dollars. Right. Ms. Smith, you had a question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, just a couple quick questions. Um, first, thank you for uh, putting in for this application. Uh, I think it's important that we uh, take steps wherever possible, um, just like what uh, Councilor DeMott said, to maximize our taxpayer funds. Um, but on to my questions. Uh, would these cameras be similar to um, a body worn? I know you said they're not plug in, um, but what type of equipment would it be? Councilor, thanks for the question. No, they would be more, they're, they're portable cameras, uh, th something that we would be able to put in a vehicle or other uh, mounting technologies, but it wouldn't be something that we would wear on a person. Okay. Um, now, I would assume that uh, any footage that is captured would be subject to the 217. Um, and maybe that's not a question for you, but um, the 217 bill that was passed. I believe, Councilor, you're Councilor, if, if, about uh, the uh, retention of video and so forth and subject to uh, release. Certainly any video that we capture, whether it's on a body cam or anything else, uh, I think it's clearly stated in that legislation that would fall under the same retention schedules and, and release priorities. Uh, last question, um, with the dollar spent, how, how many um, cameras, portable cameras, would this uh, allow us? Councilor, it would be a total of uh, six cameras, and um, in addition to that, it would be um, a, a subscription to the license plate reader technology. It's not, not part of the camera, it's a separate piece, but it's all covered within that grant. Thank you so much. I appreciate your your thoughtfulness in moving this forward. Um, I hope to see see it and support it tonight. Mr. Voles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also want to thank the police department for being creative and innovative and looking kind of outside the box for some additional money and supplementing the money we already put in. So thank you for that um i always appreciate that and i guess so two of my questions have already been answered so i only have one final question is there any match it looks like there's no match it looks like the, it's a grant and it's clean or do we have a, a, a city match funds that we need to put into this program thank you there there's no 
Go ahead, though, Chief. Sorry. I think the answer to your question, Mr. Voles, was there is no match. All right. Thank you very much. Ms. Sykes. I want to thank Councillor Smith. Um, she did also ask most of my questions for me. Um, I wanted to get a better idea. Is it so? This would be used in surveillance. Um, it sounds similar in my recollection of what was used um, uh, when we've had incidents in the past to be able to um, monitor maybe cars going in a certain area. Um, it, it, am I correct? This would be for surveillance or undercover work. Is that correct? Yes, Councillor, it could be used for that. It could be used, obviously, for a variety of different situations in high crime areas. Um, it's it's just a different uh, platform, different technology than the other cameras that we currently have in our system. The other cameras in our system uh, require a direct power source, where these are a self-contained unit, uh, rechargeable batteries that last uh, for several hours into days, uh, where it's a self-contained, it's a smaller unit that would be able to uh, be put in different areas as opposed to some of the other cameras that we have in our fleet. Well, um, I'm going to join the, the chorus of appreciation. Um, I feel like your department consistently looks for grant um, dollars to help stretch um, the taxpayers dollar to make sure we're doing the best in protecting the public interest um, and public safety. So so thanks you and to the whole team who worked on this. Um, you know, obviously, um, we really want to make sure everyone in all portions of our community feel safe and um, your explanation actually helps me feel even more comfortable voting for this tonight. So thank you. Ms. Gully. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I too want to reiterate as my fellow counselors have that this is a great grant. I'm really excited that we, that you applied for this and that we were able to receive it. Um, I do have a question. Um, I did not see in here where this is a renewable grant. So would that mean that it is a one-year grant and can we reapply for another um, additional funding in a year or um, two years or three years? And um, what would that look like? Thank you, Councillor. Let me uh, turn that to uh, uh, JJ Elliott, who is the senior management analyst for the police department who really manages our grants and I'll let her answer that question. Hi, Councillor. This is JJ Elliott. Um, yes. Well, what we, what comes of it is it, it's once a year local solicitation. So it depends on um, what funding is available, and we'd have to renew every year for a different um, funding amount. So it it just depends. But it's it's a year grant. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I work on grants as well, so I have a few. I have another question about. Um, often our equipment that we do on our grants may go, we, we usually have to register it and show that it's grant funded. If if this were to go out of date, would that, would the equipment stay with us or do we have to return it or do we have to justify it? Is there anything in the grant like that? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, there's a difference between equipment and supplies. So if it's over $5,000, yes, we have to follow the rules. That being the case, we just let them know if if the equipment no longer is in use, or it's uh, the value has gone under that five thousand dollars. Basically, we could keep it if we sustain it and keep it going. Um, but if it is something that dies, we just basically let them know and we get rid of it. But it it's notif notification, yes. And um, I had a similar question to um, Councillor Smith. Um, I loved your question about 217 because because that came up in my thoughts too. Is does this in any way meet um, any part of 217, or is this really just separate and just an extra that we're an extra step we're doing um, because because you guys are so good at your job? Thank you, uh, Councillor Scully. Let me take a stab at that. You know, in any kind of video or anything else that we collect is considered evidence, and uh, anything we collect uh, is open to public records requests and those kind of things. And of course, 
video and some of these other things are subject to a retention schedule. So this would fall under that under that same process. Excellent. Thank you so much for all your work on this. It's a great, this is a great um, award for our city and I'm very, very excited about it. All right, Council, is there any other questions or comments before we move to the public meeting? All right, seeing none at this time, I will open up the uh, hearing for public comment. Ms. Parker, do we have any comments from the public? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at this time, and up, right up until this time, we have not received any requests to um, offer testimony on this item during our meeting, nor did we receive any written comments or voicemail comments in advance of this public hearing. All right, thank you, ma'am. Seeing that there is no comment available, uh, I will then call the public meeting to closure. And then we will move on to item A2. This is a, um, Authorization to have the mayor execute the certification in support of this application. Mr. DeMott, you had requested to make the motion. Ms. Smith, you're for the second. Yes, sir. Thank you. I move to authorize the mayor to execute a written certification in support of the city's application for the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program. Ms. Smith. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion by any member of the council? Seeing none, moving on to item A2. Ms. Parker, a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll start with Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Sites votes yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Seymour votes yes. Councillor Scully. Yes. Scully votes yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Smith votes yes. Councillor Bowles. Yes. Bowles votes yes. Mayor Atchison. Yes. Atchison votes yes. And Councillor DeMott. Yes. DeMott votes yes. All right. On item A2, the council has voted 7 0 in favor of the motion. Moving on to the next item, item 10B. This is Councillor's Bill number 28. Mr. Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to pass Councilor's Bill number 28 and first reading providing for a supplemental appropriation of funds to the 2020 budget of the General Reserve, General Reserve, Water, Wastewater, and Storm Drainage Utility Enterprise, Legacy Ridge Golf Course Enterprise, Investigation Recoveries, and the General Capital Improvement Funds. Ms. Sykes. Second. I have a motion and a second for item 10B, Council's Bill number 28. Is there any discussion by Council? Seeing none, Ms. Parker, item 10B, Council's Bill number 28. Roll call, please. Certainly. Councilor Seymour. Yes. Seymour votes yes. Councilor Scully. Yes. Scully votes yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Smith votes yes. Councillor Bowles. Yes. Bowles votes yes. Mayor Atchison. Yes. Atchison votes yes. Councillor DeMott. Yes. DeMott votes yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Sites votes yes. All right, thank you, Council. We're moving on. That is Council Bill number 28 passes on a 7 0 vote. Next item off the agenda is item C1. This is a Big Dry Creek facility. Ms. Sykes. Thank you. I move to authorize the reallocation of $593,795 from the Big Dry Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility Solids Dewatering and Campus Wide Improvements Capital Project Account to the Big Dry Creek Wastewater Treatment and Treatment Facility Aeration Basins Improvement Project Account. Mr. Seymour. I second. 
I have a motion and a second for item 10 C1. The comments or questions from council. Mr. Voles, you have a question. Yeah, I do. I think it, if I'm reading this, is this the, uh, if we add aeration to this, it looks like we were looking forward looking on this. If we add aeration to this process, is the end result less nitrogen in our environment? Is this the right project I'm looking at? Is that uh, that the end result is we get the nitrogen out of the water coming out of the wastewater treatment plant? Um, and is that the result of what we're trying to do here? Mr. Tripp, turn to you. Councilor <clears throat> Bowles, yes, I believe you, you have a right, but Let's bring the uh, experts in here on the science of all this. Um, either thank you, public works director, or one of the staff members that's working on that, please. Councilor Voles, this is Max Kirschbaum, director of public works and utilities. I'll uh, I'll take the first part of this answer, and and uh, I also have with me Julie Kaler, the utility engineering manager. If I miss anything critical, I'm sure she'll be happy to add. Um, we had been under several years of um, work with the CDPHE at the state level to reissue a new discharge permit for our wastewater treatment facility. Uh, we finally received that in a final version in November of 2019. One of the criteria that is spelled out on that discharge permit is total inorganic nitrogen. There are many chemical compounds that we have to meet discharge characteristics for, for release back into Big Dry Creek. In this particular case, um, we, we already come, do pretty well with total inorganic nitrogen, but we uh, while we had active projects going on at Big Dry Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility, we undertook earlier, a few months ago, the opportunity with HDR Engineering to do the pre-design work for process and or physical improvements that would allow us to meet that uh, new compliance agreement for permit uh, requirement for total inorganic nitrogen. We've come upon a, a proposed solution and now it's time to design and then construct that work as because every, every change in a permit requirement comes with a timetable for implementation. So we are facing also a timetable to implement. Julie, is there anything that you'd like to add to that that I missed? Uh, thank you, Max. The big change in this permit is the daily total of total inorganic nitrogen for which the staff must account for and sample. So by adding less air and adding the air in a different way, we are reducing on a daily and hourly and minutely basis the amount of nitrogen so that staff can sample and meet this more restrictive requirement. Well, thank you, Max. Thank you guys for that answer. And I, this is a really important project. And I, you know, it's a half a million dollars we're talking about here. So thank you for those explanations. I appreciate that. And I read the the memo, but I just wanted a little more. Just kind of, am I thinking about this right? So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Other thank questions? you for your work on this. Right. Other questions from council? Seeing no other questions, Ms. Parker, this is item C1. Roll call, please. Certainly. Councillor Scully. Yes. Scully votes yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Smith votes yes. Councillor Voles. Yes. Voles votes yes. Mayor Acheson. Yes. Acheson votes yes. Councillor DeMott. Yes. DeMott votes yes. Counts, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Sites votes yes. And Councillor Seymour. Yes. Seymour votes yes. All right. Thank you, Council. That passes items 10C1 on a 7-0 vote in favor.
favor of the motion. Ms. Sykes, would you go with C2, please? Yes, I move based on the recommendation of the city manager to determine that the public interest will be best served by utilizing a negotiated contract with HDR Engineering Inc. to provide design engineering services for the Big Dry Creek uh, Wastewater Treatment Facility Aeration Basins Improvement Project in the amount of $539,814 and authorize a contingency in the amount of $53,981 for a total authorized expenditure of $593,795 on this project. Mr. Seymour. Second. I have a motion and a second on item 10C2. Are there any questions or comments from council? Seeing no comments, Ms. Parker, 10C2, roll call vote, please. Certainly, Councillor Smith. Yes. Smith votes yes. Councillor Voles. Yes. Voles votes yes. Mayor Atchison. Yes. Atchison votes yes. Councillor DeMott. Yes. DeMott votes yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Sites votes yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Seymour votes yes. And Councillor Scully. Yes. Scully votes yes. Thank you, Council. Item 10C2 passes on a 7 0 vote. Moving to the next item, item 10D. Ms. Sites. Thank you. I move based on a recommendation of the city manager to find the public interest will be best served by increasing the authorized total amount for purchases made through the approved enterprise agreement with Microsoft. Oh my goodness, sorry. Uh, with Microsoft from 300,000 to 500,000 in 2020 and from 900,000 to 1,500 over the three years of the agreement subject to the annual appropriations. Ms. Seitz, would you correct that? That's 1,500,000. But I'm sorry, I must have, yes, 1,500,000. Okay, Ms. Smith. Second. I have a motion and a second for item 10D. Are there customs or counsel from counsel in regard to this item? Mr. DeMott. Uh, was was Councillor Voles in the queue before me? I don't want to jump the line, but I th thought I saw his name come up first. It was, but you can go ahead, Councillor DeMott, if you prefer. Um, why don't you go ahead? Because I know you had some good questions earlier, so you may get mine answered. So go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor DeMott. I that I just had one quick question and I really just want to ask this for the record um, we so in this particular agreement we had a, an agreement already in place at a an original agreement at a lower amount we passed that uh, I think February 24th at a city council meeting on February 24th does this agreement um, this uh, enterprise agreement is not substantially different the only thing that is different is the amount that uh, mayor Perkins sites just read which is in our memorandum just the figures are changing there's nothing substantially different about the agreement itself is that correct thank you thank you for the question Councillor Bowles uh, our information technology director Emily Littlejohn is on the line here Emily would you take that please Absolutely. Emily Littlejohn, IT Director here, and Councillor Volts, you are absolutely correct. There are no substantial changes to the enterprise agreement. What we are asking for is the authorization to increase the spend with Microsoft as a result of the pandemic um, changes to our, our infrastructure and the need to purchase further software and licenses. So you are absolutely correct. And can you, is that because we have more people working from home or what are the reasons for that increase? What would you say is during this pandemic, it's unprecedented and we're all working differently. And I know I am and what I do. And so is it because we have more staff 
uh, we want to be safe and have them work remotely at home. That's also correct. I do have our information systems manager, Phil Shires, on the line as well, and he can speak to particular purchases that are made under the Microsoft agreement. Phil, as you get queued up, I'll let you take that question. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Phil Shires, Information Systems Manager. Yes, Councillor Voss, that's it, correct. We are rolling out uh, instant messaging software that we were not planning on doing under the original contract. So that is the reason for the increase in spend. Thank you for that. And so Ms. Littlejohn and, and Mr. Shires, thank you for those answers. And I just wanna say thank you for everything you're doing to, to facilitate staff being safe, working remotely, and all of that goes into that. I'm sure it was all unexpected. A lot of it's new territory, I'm sure. So thank you for all of your hard work and uh, just please thank the team there who are working with you. I know Matt Matt Williams works with us on council a lot. He's been tremendously um, helpful. Uh, so I, I'm sure you're doing that for staff throughout the organization, throughout City Hall. So thank you for all your hard work on this. And I plan to support this tonight. Thank you for those answers. Right. Mr. DeMont. Thank you, Councilor Voles, for those good questions. Um, I do still have some concerns and questions on this, so I understand the reasoning, but um, considering our budget budget place, um, why now, besides you know having instant messaging, do we have any other kind of capability of instant messaging right now? What do we do today? Um, and then my other question that maybe you can just answer right off, I'll throw it out there, is um, how does this go into, um, you know, governmental records and how does it get recorded? I'm imagining it's all still subject to CORA being a governmental entity. Yes, uh, Councilor DeMont, this is Phil Shires. I can I take that question. Uh, Teams, one of the reasons that we are leveraging the Microsoft solution is that it does provide the recording, the archiving and the compliance required for CORA and for record discovery. There are other instant messaging solutions that we have looked at in order to provide the same level of service and discovery. They are more expensive and they don't integrate with the city's applications. We are currently a Microsoft shop. So there are other integrations that allow us to uh, leverage technology from Microsoft at a lower cost. And I guess the other thing, and I mean, I, I kind of am nerding out on this because this is my realm of expertise. So I, this, I'm an IT guy by day. So I'm just trying to also understand why now, like what are we doing today to meet the needs of communicating? Um, it, not because I don't think this is probably a great tool for the city. I'm just having a struggle with adding additional spend right now. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pitched as a cost savings. Um, and, and I'm not making that connection. So maybe you can help me with that. Of course. Uh, one of the other funding sources for this instant messaging application is coming from the CARES Fund. So right now, leveraging the CARES Act, we are able to deploy this instant messaging solution, which allows our internal staff to be able to communicate as if we were in the building to keep them home and safe. And we are trying to fund this out of, we will be funding this out of the CARES Act. Okay, so that helps a bit, but then, you know, how many years are we allowed to, so I guess actually that's part of the question. So you, you're funding it for a certain amount of years. Are we allowed to do that with the CARES Act? And then what happens, you know, after the CARES Act, we've added additional budget. Are we anticipating not using this um, past that point? So we are funding it out of 2020 for the CARES Act. I do not know if they're going to extend that into 21. Uh, that is still to be determined by uh, the federal. We will be purchasing it this year and then looking at next year, if we don't have appropriated funds, we can remove the teams from our enterprise agreement at that time. Okay, so that we're, we're not stuck with it for the three years. We are not stuck with it for three years if the funds are not appropriated. Um, and you may not be able to answer this question, but I'm curious if we pass this and we... Um approve the dollars that you so you said it's just this year but i see it's across multiple years how does that get unwound as far as what we're approving here today and that's probably not a question for you I'm not sure who can answer that for me actually i can take a stab at it for you uh so the funds were approved were approved under the uh the 8b item earlier in this evening 
Okay, so we will put that into our annual operating uh, agenda items that we put forth. So for this year, it is actually under the licensing agreement that we have with CDW, which is our value added reseller. So we mm -hmm. purchase our enterprise licensing through them under that 8B agenda item discussed earlier this evening. This uh, item is more of an FYI, or I'm sorry, not FYI. This is more of a uh, requesting approval to increase it for the previously authorized, not necessarily the spend. I see. I see. Um, okay. Well, Cause, that, cause that, you, I'm sorry, sir. No, go ahead. Because uh, as you know, under the enterprise agreement, the agreement that the contract is written is between us and Microsoft, which outlines our services, the warranty, and what products we're allowed to purchase and at what pricing level. But the prices are actually determined by the value added reseller, not Microsoft directly. Yep. Yep. No, I, I buy through CDW as well. So, um, but, but, no, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. I just really wanted to make sure that we weren't um, knowing how some of these contracts work. You know, sometimes there's an out and sometimes there's a not. So I wanted to make sure not we're not tied to it past the COVID dollars just because we don't know what next year looks like. So I didn't want to dip into the general fund for something new. But that makes sense. And I think that seems like a, a decent spend of the COVID dollars or CARES dollars. So I appreciate you um, answering all my questions. All right, Ms. Smith, you had a comment or a question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, and these questions may not be for uh, Ms. Littlejohn, um, but and maybe not entirely pertinent to the contractual questions, um, but as a full picture, it helps me understand what I'm improving. So I'll just read my questions, and if someone uh, could respond, that would be helpful. Uh, do we have a plan or a schedule um, as for, far as City Hall goes that it will open back up and bring employees back to the offices? And do our employees know that schedule? And are we tracking, or excuse me, are we working at, at at least 50% workforce? Uh, and that's not including our police department or public works. I would like to know what we're at for workforce within our offices. And then are we tracking how much pro productivity we have from folks working from home um, and how much uh, this is required in order to make this decision? I do know, Councillor Bowles, this is City Manager Don Tripp, that it's our intention at the end of this week to provide you with some specific dates uh, concerning the reentry of city staff uh, into City Hall um, for, for partial city operations. And I'll wait till those dates are finalized and we'll, we'll send that to you. Um, Deputy uh, Barbara Opie is uh, in charge of that uh, part of um, the COVID management. And I think she's also going to address some of this a little bit later this evening in the COVID report, or pretty soon here in the COVID report. Um, I don't know about, uh, you know, I guess I'd have to, I've not heard anything that specifically is tracking productivity. I do know that the work's getting done um, and, and we are able to provide, we've been able surprisingly to provide an uninterrupted um, amount of that work uh, in all service areas at this point. Um, I think that's, ha been, that's happened with um, a lot of tech, technology support and a lot of personal sacrifice, um, but I can report that. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, I'll ask Barbara when she comes up here after a bit uh, to see if she has anything she wants to add to that, but you can uh, be assured that we're going to provide you with some dates in terms of, again, the city opening of the building. That's, that's not the council meetings. The council meetings um, are up to the seven of you, and um, that'll be a decision that you'll make, and then we'll, we'll attempt to implement from that. And this is actually Councillor Smith, not Councillor Bowles. So... Um, I know you, I think you addressed cancer bowls <laughs> in the beginning. So um, I appreciate that and look forward to um, Ms. Opie's response. Are there other questions in regards to item 10 D? I'm sorry, what, did I misunderstand that she would respond now or later? In her COVID updates, I think she's going to do it, Ms. Smith. Okay. I would like them now if if that's possible. Um, to help really understand what exactly we're 
Councillor Smith, this is Barbara Obi, Deputy City Manager. Uh, happy to help try to answer the question. Um, as uh, City Manager Don Tripp mentioned, uh, we are working on um, identifying some specific dates. I don't have them specifically yet to be able to release now. We do anticipate giving them to City Council later this week for some a few facility reopenings, including a target date for City Hall to reopen um, and, and having limited reopening as far as initially. And we have phases that we plan to slowly bring staff back in and, and identify a limited capacity of city of the public coming back in. As, um, as City Manager Tripp mentioned, um, the council meetings, um, that is, uh, uh, we're looking for direction from City Council as to timing with that, but um, hopefully they can line with each other. Um, but obviously if council wants to move more quickly then we can work to do so. There are some details that we're trying to work through as far as the nuances of public comment and that's one of our challenges, but we'll, we'll continue to pursue that. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, again, are there other comments or questions on item 10D? Ms. Parker, this is a roll call vote, please, for item 10D. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Bowles. Yes. Bowles votes yes. Mayor Atchison. Yes. Atchison votes yes. Councillor DeMott. Yes. DeMott votes yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Sites votes yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Seymour votes yes. Councillor Scully. Yes. Scully votes yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. And Smith votes yes. Thank you, Council. Item 10D passes on a 7 0 vote. Moving on to the next item in the agenda is item 11A. This is old business. This is Councillor's Bill number 26. Mr. Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to pass Councilor's Bill number 26 on second reading, authorizing the amendments to chapters 8-7, 8-8, and 8-12 of the Westminster Municipal Code regarding the city's water, reclaim water, sewer utilities, and utilities service rules. Mr. Bowles. I second the motion. We okay, have a motion and a second for item 11A, Council's Bill number 26. Are there any questions or comments by Council? Mr. DeMott. Just real quickly, wanted to take a moment to remind uh, people or let people know that didn't listen when we did the first reading of this bill. I'm not in favor of it because I felt like um, pushing some of the responsibility or authority down to the director level I wasn't comfortable with, so I will be voting no, but I wanted to make sure that people understood why. Okay, any other comments, Ms. Smith? Thank you. I was also a no on this, uh, moving it forward uh, for similar reasons. Uh, I'm not comfortable with their wording and uh, the authority of delegation for this uh, in our charter. So thank you. Ms. Sykes. Um, similar to my colleagues, I just want to go on the record about why I'm going to be voting yes. Um, earlier tonight, we saw um, the types of efforts that need to happen in order for us um, to be able to comply with CDPHE changing guidelines. And so this um, allows for um, timely changing to be in the hands of our director of public utilities who really understands both the science engineering and the requirements of CDPHE. And so I'm very comfortable. Um, this isn't really a policy, this is a compliance um, issue and, and just allowing um, the most nimble and efficient way to to, to do that. Um, so I will be voting yes. Other comments from any other council members? Seeing no other comments, Ms. Parker, this is Council's Bill number 26, second reading. Please do a roll call vote. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Atchison votes yes. Councilor DeMont. Mont votes no. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Sites votes yes. Councillor Seymour. 
Yes. Seymour votes yes. Councillor Scully. Yes. Scully votes yes. Councillor Smith. No. Smith votes no. Councillor Bowles. Yes. And Bowles votes yes. Councillor's bill number 26 is passed on a 5 2 vote. We'll move on to our next item, which is item 11B. This is Council's bill number 27 on an emergency ordinance for the adoption of the 2021 budget. Mr. Voles, it looks like you're up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to pass Councilor's Bill number 27 as an emergency ordinance providing for the adoption of the 2021 budget no later than November 30th, 2020. Mr. Seymour. Second. I have a motion and a second for the passing of Councilor's Bill number 27 as an emergency ordinance. Any other comments or questions from the Council? Ms. Sykes. Um, so this will allow, if passed, will allow um, city staff a little bit more time in coming up with the budget. As we've discussed um, multiple times just even tonight, we are kind of facing an unprecedented um, economic situation. And so making sure we have the best data, um, the most amount of time for community feedback, and the most amount of time for consideration as a council, um, I think that this is, is warranted. Um, especially under our emergency declaration, allowing us to um, kind of uh, have a waiver for that um, charter requirement. Um, I think we like to hold our charter pretty sacred. Um, and so it, 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 I would not be supportive if it was not such um, extraordinary circumstances. So I wanna hear from my colleagues, but tonight um, at this point, I intend to vote yes. Mr. DeMott. Um, I think that, you know, it's been unfortunate the year that we've had, and I think this is a necessary step, but I'll take the moment to kind of beat the dead horse and remind um, staff that I really would like to be in front of the public before we go into actually voting on a budget. I think that the people deserve to look us in the face and in some light, whether that's, you know, through some creative means, um, but I'd like to be able to see our residents and have them speak in, in the budget uh, before we approve something. Thank you. Other comments from council? Seeing none, Ms. Parker, this is a roll call vote for council's bill number 27. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll begin with Councillor DeMott. Yes. DeMott votes yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Sites votes yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Seymour votes yes. Councillor Scully. Yes. Scully votes yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Smith votes yes. Councillor Bowles. Yes. Bowles votes yes. And Mayor Atchison. Yes. Atchison votes yes. At this time, council that passes council's bill number 27 on a roll call vote of seven in favor, none against. Uh, before we move on to the next piece, that concludes all of the actions and uh, actions that we have to take tonight as council. We have the <clears throat> COVID-19 updates uh, coming up next. Following that, we have a report from the city manager. Once that is done, then we will be uh, convening into an executive session uh, with uh, Judge Soares uh, after that. Before we go into the COVID report, though, I'm gonna go ahead and give the council a short break it's uh, currently 8.35. I'd like everyone to try to be back within five minutes. It'll be at 8.40. So for the present time, we are in recess.
All right, Ms. Parker, if you could confirm the council's return. Certainly, Mayor Atchison. Yes. Councilor DeMont. Yep. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Councilor Seymour. Yes. Councilor Scully. Councilor Smith. Present. Councilor Bowles. Here. And we'll try Councilor Scully again. It looks like we may be waiting on just one more, Mayor. Okay, that's fine. Let me know as soon as you can figure out if she's back. And just confirming, I believe Councillor Scully is back. Councillor Scully, can you confirm? Yes, I'm back. Thank you. Mr. Thank Mayor, all are present. All right, thank you. Mr. Tripp, our next item up is our COVID update. If you'd like to have uh, your team lead off on that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to apologize also earlier for um, mistaking uh, two council members by name. I think I was looking at uh, Councillor Bowles's name on the report here and it just came out my apologies the um tonight's uh, covid 19 report is a report that we do at every meeting the council requested from the beginning of covid so they so they're kept informed um on you know some of the high uh, level uh, information uh, and updates related to financial sustainability and uh, the impact on the business community uh, and other matters one of the things that we're going to talk we talk about every week is data uh, Max Kirschbaum will give an update to that tonight. We had intended to have Barbara cover um, uh, the facility opening information. She was able to include that uh, while Councillor Smith was getting her questions answered earlier, so she won't come on tonight. Uh, there's also been a follow-up to strategic hiring uh, that's been um, that has actually frozen several positions in the city. We'll provide a short report on that and answer your questions, and then uh, Council camera protocols and uh honestly i don't know who's going to handle that um when we get to that point we'll figure that out so max if you kick off with data and then um larry door will have a, a, a financial report including uh, an opening to the strategic hiring discussion thank you thank you mr tripp and uh, matt if you could bring up uh, the slides for this evening um, at Council's request over the last few weeks, um, we will be showing this evening two additional slides that relate to uh, positivity rate. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with three familiar slides and two slides that you'll be seeing for the first time. The first one is the uh, state CDPHE slide with the three-day average of COVID cases. This is reporting as, as it was through August 22nd. Uh, what's notable about this slide is that I think we can say that we continue to be on a downward trend for the fourth week. Go ahead, slide please. Uh, this one is a slide we had been previously showing last, but I'm putting it together with the other state slide and you'll see why in a moment. Um, but this slide is also familiar to you, showing not only the, the bar portion of this chart, showing the number of tests performed by CDPHE and by commercial labs. And uh, maybe more importantly on this slide is the red line that shows the positivity rate uh, across the state. Um, 
what you see uh, the to the far right of this slide on that that red line is a positivity rate of 2.82 as of August 22nd. So generally um, that number has stayed below about 3% for about the last month or nearly the last month as well. Okay, next slide, please. So let's look at uh, Jefferson County. This slide is familiar. The, the, when we get to it, the next slide will be a first time showing. This is the three day moving average uh, of the Jefferson County public health uh, total positive cases. Uh, again, if you focus on <clears throat> not on the shaded areas as much as the darker green line. Um, that three-day moving average on as of the uh, 21st of August was at 28, 28 cases. And generally, again, a downward trend since uh, late July, so about the last four weeks. Next slide. Okay, uh, this is a... Uh, a first time viewing this slide, the question that you had asked is, can you provide positivity rate data specifically for Westminster? So um, we have, through the city manager, um, we have corresponded with both Dr. Douglas at Tri-County Health and doc, in this case, Dr. Johnson at uh, Jefferson County Public Health. Jefferson County can provide that information as a roll up for the county. They do not have positivity rate data broken down by municipality within the, within the county. That's why you see on the upper right, the text notation that says uh, Westminster specific data is not available, but this is a, a chart with that positivity rate uh, for Jefferson County. The, the uh, blue line on that chart is that three-day positivity rate, which was at 3.25 on August 20th. So a little bit higher than the state, um, and that should not be surprising that the, the counties in the metro Denver area would be a little bit higher than the overall state average. So that number is 3.25 for the county. Next slide, please. As we go on to Tri-County Public Health and specifically Adams County data, this is a familiar chart to you, same as we have been showing. Uh, the, uh, the first, or I'm sorry, the last two week period is shown on the right half of this slide. You can see that the three-day average of the number of positive cases has remained uh, a little bit up and down, but I would venture to call that fairly steady over a two-week period. And uh, to be specific, on August 22nd, uh, that, that plot uh, for the Adams County portion of this chart is at about 45.3 for a three-day rolling average. Next slide, please. And the, this is also the last slide. The Tri-County Health is able to provide a breakdown by municipality. So as the note states in the upper right corner of this chart, this is Westminster specific data from Tri-County Public Health and, and, and Adams County. And here that uh, the, maybe focus your eye on the red line, which is the positivity rate. Um, and uh, the, the, the data point that I'll point out is on August 21st, that is a 4.3% positivity rate. Again, it's 4.3% uh, is higher than Jefferson County as a county, and it's higher than the state average, uh, which again, 
would be expected being part of the Denver metro area. So that concludes the data presentation for this evening. That's all I have, thank you. Ms. Seitz, you have a question. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Kirschbaum, um, for this presentation and for your efforts to get us this slides. I noticed that little um, box that says past week's data are incomplete. Um, can you describe that? Do, are we confident that 4.3% or do we think um, we'll find that that could go lower if we get that tests that were taken came back as negative um, and, and we haven't gotten the results yet or or higher with, with the opposite? It, or are we pretty certain with the number of outstanding that it's going to be right around 4.3? I just, I wanted to make sure I understand what that note means. Two, thank you. Uh, the two public health agencies typically put a caveat like that on all the data uh, because there are delays in reporting. And um, so what they want the reader to know is if you're looking at the most recent data on the chart, just be aware that um, uh, some of that may continue to change uh, in days ahead as a, additional reporting is be, becomes available. But generally speaking, as we've looked at many of these charts, there are not there are not wild fluctuations from uh, any of the later data that's presented. If they do change, it's typically by fairly small amounts. Thank you. Other questions from council? All right, seeing none guys, go ahead. Deputy Door. Thank you, Mr. Tripp. Thank you, Mayor and members of City Council. Mr. Williams, if you would, uh, uh, if you, just for the sake of distraction, if we want to have those uh, move, that'd be just great. And I'm not quite ready, Mr. Williams, for our strategic hiring there. I just wanted to offer a very brief update on the Coronavirus Aid Recovery and Economic Security Act uh, under financial sustainability. And uh, earlier, Councillor Smith had a question about uh, September 1st, and we do have a, a sort of a the first occasion happening uh, on September 1st, uh, just a little over a week uh, from tonight, and that is that the city needs to file a spending plan with Jefferson County under the city's intergovernmental agreement with the county. And fortunately, we um, <clears throat> set forth a significant effort uh, as a city with uh, council's approval of uh, our guiding principles and our appropriations. So we'll be able to provide a report to the county uh, without any delay and, and I think with some very good description and so forth. But because that deadline was coming up, I just wanted to make sure that I was informing council that we're on target to meet that deadline and also just update you very quickly on the spending. Uh, so far, $2,682,000 of the city's CARES funds allocation uh, have been spent. Uh, that leaves 6296000 to go, and I uh, just wanted to kind of give you a little background on those. And you've seen uh, periodic updates on spending initiatives. Uh, you've approved uh, some uh, agreements, intergovernmental agreements, with uh, some of our uh, uh, second and third parties, or rather uh, under our uh, people and programs serving people initiatives. And then I uh, also wanted to let you know that uh, on our website, on our COVID-19 page, we now have a, a bit of a dashboard that describes our various spending initiatives, not just related to CARES, but all of COVID-19 uh, for your viewing. So I felt it was just the right time to uh, provide a little bit of an, of an update related to the deadline and also uh, related to some of our spending initiatives. And of course, uh, we'll keep you informed as we approach our next deadlines, uh, which aren't until uh, the first week of September for our uh, Jefferson County spending, and then the very end of December uh, for um, our Adams County spending. So uh, with that, I just wanted to check uh, Mayor and Council if uh, there are any questions on uh, the update or the deadline and report, then I'll just move forward into item three under COVID update, sir. 
Questions from Council, Mr. DeMott. Before we get into the hiring freeze, and this actually, I just didn't get a spot for it because we didn't cover the going back to City Hall. So I just wanted to make kind of a comment slash recommendation that was brought to me by actually a resident as far as a potential possibility to get people to be able to talk to us. And so one of the questions that was asked to me, and I don't know if this is something we've thought about, is if there's some way that we could have basically a, a computer set up at City Hall where people could come in and actually speak face to face with us on camera. I know one of the concerns with, you know, bringing on the people on the camera is it's not controlled, but if there was a way for us to be able to do that on, my, my preference obviously is, is going back to city hall, but even when we go back, we don't know for sure, you know, what that means. So this could be a good in between. And I thought it was a good idea and we didn't get a natural place to bring that up in, in our report before we get too far away from, uh, city manager Trim mentioning the fact that you know Barbara shared that earlier on. Um, I wanted to at least put that out there as a as something for us to think about. Other comments on Mr. Doar's report? Ms. Sykes. Um, this may not be directly to um, Director Door, but similar to, to Councillor DeMont, it, it seems like this might be the most appropriate place to bring it up. Um, I really love all that we have done trying to partner with our business community to try to stabilize them, particularly our restaurant community. Um, I believe actually Councillor Seymour has brought this up in the past about plans for when the weather changes and um, restaurants are not able to utilize their their patios. Have we heard of other what other communities are doing? Um, what type of retrofitting um, restaurants can do to increase safety to maybe help consumer confidence? Um, I don't expect an answer tonight, but I was wondering if someone could kind of um, let us know if there's best practices or if there's different steps um, that we might be able to take with CARES dollars, without CARES dollars. I know we've already kind of spoken for most of our CARES dollars, but maybe even technical assistance um, for some of these restaurants to figure out how to survive um, the colder months. Thank you, Mayor Pratam, uh, Larry Dorr, uh, once again. Uh, we'll note this and have a bit of an update in a coming uh, COVID report and under long-term recovery. And uh, as you know, uh, our uh, Director of Economic Development, John Hall, has really been involved uh, very, very much in the city's long-term recovery and in our, our business assistance. And in as much as it'll be a few weeks before uh, we'll have another update, we have, because we have our, uh, council session upcoming on protocols, and then also uh, we have, uh, I believe it's there's a holiday in there as well. We'll be prepared to describe some of those things and potentially uh, even some next steps uh, in our in our business recovery. So duly noted, and uh, we will bring that forward, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> that was a little... Mr. Demont. You have another question. I just want to make sure that staff uh, captured what I shared because nobody spoke back and I, I would just like to know I was heard. Thank you for having Councilor yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you. All right, seeing no other comments, Mr. Doerr, I think we're up to item three. Yes, sir, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, let me see. Uh, prior to Council's uh, meeting a week ago, uh, we received an inquiry from a council member DeMott regarding some details and a request for information and update on the city's uh, strategic hiring freeze. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, at council's meeting a week ago, I provided an update on some of the statistics and details, uh, but because a couple of uh, council members uh, were not present at the meeting, um, it was asked that that be uh, continued. Uh, Councilors Smith and Voles had also uh, asked for the discussion matter uh, to come forward. So, Mr. Williams, if you would provide uh, uh, the slide that I, I had a week ago, and I've, I've, I've created, we've added some updates, let me just say, uh, but I felt it was best, uh, Mayor, uh, for you and Council and the public who might be listening to just get this context 
uh, as I walk through uh, what's happened thus far, and then I've, I have added some additional detail as was requested a week ago. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, with the major closures uh, happening on March 17th, uh, that's the date uh, that this uh, goes back to where the, our city manager directed uh, our strategic hiring freeze uh, in response to these uh, great unknowns and this uh, fiscal crisis that came with the public health uh, crisis uh, at the same time. What we've done, because we've always described this as being a hiring freeze with exceptions or a hiring freeze uh, with a strategic review, um, we've uh, attached to this uh, our workflow, our process for filling any vacant positions. Uh, obviously, and it moves here from left to right. So uh, when a position becomes vacant, either through retirement, uh, separation, or any other reason, uh, the immediate supervisor will undertake an evaluation and discuss that uh, with the next level of supervision, potentially a division manager, and some sort of recommendation will come forward. And if it's if it's believed that this supports uh, either revenue collection or if this is a first responder or a person, a worker who supports a first responder or uh, if the position supports a council goal or is within our utility, it'll be presented to the department heads for evaluation. And then uh, a review will occur from our human resources department and our policy and budget department. And they will uh, potentially make a recommendation at any point along the way here this in this evaluation uh, the process could end and the position could be frozen and become vacant and I'll, I'll describe these color codes here in a minute but if it uh, continues on then the deputy city managers uh, would review that and if it is approved then it would enter the recruit recruitment phase where we'll advertise and interview and uh, uh, do background checks and all the ordinary uh, matters that we would do in our recruitment and then fill the position. So back to the color coding, when a position becomes vacant, um, it will then uh, potentially move into an evaluation phase, potentially move into a recruitment phase and then be filled. But many vacant positions will remain as such uh, until the city manager changes our current status with strategic hiring freeze. So Mr. Williams, next slide. On this slide, uh, we've listed those again color coded. So we have under evaluation uh, presently four vacancies that uh, uh, the supervision uh, are reviewing for uh, meeting those uh, various things that I just described and may or may not make a recommendation up there chain of command for potentially filling the position. We are recruiting for 14 positions. You see those listed here. Uh, we're in that uh, phase of our um, of our process and um, we're moving forward with these um, in, that, in that phase. And we've filled 30 positions over the course of our strategic hiring um, freeze. And we've got them listed here. And what I've added are the dates that uh, each of the positions were filled. You'll see that on a couple of occasions, we've filled firefighter positions at different dates along the way, either from lateral hires or uh, from our recruit classes and so forth. And, and you can see the mix uh, across that and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and then on the next slide, you see the positions that uh, are vacant and are intended to remake, remain vacant until a change in status of our strategic hiring freeze at some, frankly, at some indefinite point in the future. And you can see we have some partial FTEs. These are listed by, by department. And one thing I wanted to highlight, I spoke to this uh, a week ago, but I wanted to add it to the slide, and that's the piece in the lower right-hand corner, and that is uh, we're really in the middle of our seasonal workforce time period. We would t uh, have as many as 1,600 hours uh, per week worked by our seasonal workforce that uh, is not being worked at the minute. And also, uh, we this week, uh, we are down about 250 people in our seasonal workforce. Now, we're getting closer to the end of our season, but we're still, uh, we would still have a significant uh, workforce uh, yet that is vacant uh, and creating that savings that I described earlier tonight, which year to date is about uh, $1.3 million. And we think for the most recent month, about $270,000. So it's certainly uh, having a significant financial impact and uh, is meeting our goal to uh, mitigate the impacts 
uh, from our revenue declines, which uh, we've talked about quite a bit. Um, so with that, um, I'll just turn it to you, Mayor and Council, if there were any questions, and I, I think there were some follow-up comments. Thank you. Uh, Council, any comments or questions? Mr. DeMont. Thank you. Could we go back one slide, please? So we asked if we could push this off to this week because uh, city manager Tripp wasn't able to join us when we had this discussion before. And so I just wanted to put across in the meeting uh, to city manager Tripp that my personal opinion is that we, these, the communication area lead graphic designer I, and basically those four in the city manager's office to me don't, don't make sense right now. And I really don't understand um, hiring those at this point and my preference would be that we defer those and that's what I wanted to share tonight after we got the presentation um, and I couldn't do that last week um, or I didn't think it was appropriate until he was here in case he wanted to respond. Mr. Tripp, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to if there's others that want to comment first. Um, they could certainly do that, but I, I'd be happy to. Um, Councilor DeMott, I, I, I share your concern. Um, you know, we, we began this uh, selective hiring freeze back in late March with the idea that we, we were going into uncharted territory and didn't, real, didn't know at that point even what we would need. Um, we organized that by asking the three deputy city managers to review with great scrutiny uh, positions as they came forward, and this is the, this is the result of that. Um, I've continued to talk with them, and I want to give you a little background in the communication area that um, some have and maybe some don't, but dating back to, uh, and, and by the way, I, I don't want any of this to sound as if um, I discount what you're saying, because I think I have, I share the same concerns, and we're, uh, you know, the hiring all, of all four of these is under review right now. We, we are not, uh, two of the positions we've recruited and we're in the midst of and it's my intent to proceed with those, but uh, two of them we have not started yet, uh, and two of them we actually had already deferred. So, um, you know, we've frozen a couple of positions previously. But let me let me just go back to an explanation as to why we think this is important. Uh, back as long ago as 2016, um, the council uh, asked me, directed me. Uh, as a part of my annual evaluation and review uh, to improve our job and communications. And, and we endeavored to do that with the four staff that we had over a couple of years. Truthfully, with uh, some effort towards that, we did not make a lot of progress. And we were still having difficulty with the public uh, getting the information that they needed, uh, we all felt, and, uh, and being um, really ahead of a number of issues that were happening in the community. And, you know, our city has been changing a lot in the last several years. And uh, these changes, uh, it's necessary for people to understand them and, and to, and, and also for the council to engage. Um, so in 2018, um, I spoke to this, the Colorado Municipal League who had helped other cities with their communication challenges. And they provided me with the name of, uh, Pete Webb and Associates um, in Denver, who had done some work in other cities, Pete came in and did an audit, which is a way that we approach uh, low functioning work in the city sometimes uh, to get an outside look and to get best practice and, and to see where we might be falling short. That audit came back um, and I shared it at the time. It's, it's available still. It was very direct in that we had um, a reactive communication program, but we did not have a proactive strategic uh, pro, uh, communication program. And so it made several recommendations and recommended um, some of the staff that we uh, have, have yet to fill. Um, so suffice it to say, there's some foundation behind this that historically uh, is with a desire to be a higher performing organization as to transparency and the ability for the public to understand our business, and we we hope to continue to get there. Um, we also surveyed at the time the numbers of FTEs and other organizations, and you know we were woefully less than that. And even with the full 
um, filling of all the positions that have now been authorized, we'd still be uh, towards the lower end of it, but I think we'd be in a position that we felt comfortable we could really improve our efforts. Um, having said that, um, I, we, we hear you. Um, we, there's a lot of sacrifice going on. I do think that the two positions that we have recruited for are going to be necessary um, to begin to meet the requirements. Um, we'll look at the other positions. I've, I've asked uh, just in the last just in the last few days to this committee to take a look at those again and to reconsider that. Um, and we'll endeavor to make the best decisions we possibly can uh, that help us balance a con continuing high performance organization that. Uh, is transparent, open to the community, that has also good internal communication. So that's the background, um, and uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated along the way. And I think also, um, you know, we'll be talking September 19th about uh, where we are financially. Uh, every month that goes by helps us a little bit more. And I can assure you along the way here, if you look at the ones that we've frozen to this point, We've been fairly successful um, in providing some savings in that way uh, and through the other things that you've heard before. Uh, and we are fortunate to have gone into this with deep reserves um, and a very strong financial standing. Um, tonight, you took an action um, to put the money back in that we took out uh, about three and a half months ago to help the business community. Um, I feel terrific about that. You know, we I thought that was a bold move on uh, the city's part, and we appreciate your support to get ahead and and support the business community. But now that money is going back into our reserves, so our reserves are back to where they were before COVID. Um, again, having said that, exclamation point on your concern, Councilor Demott, and uh, we continue to take that very seriously. Any other comments, Mr. Demont? Um, yeah, I I appreciate the the recap so people understand. I mean, I question how effective we've been with adding all the communication people. Personally, I feel like a lot of times it seems like now we're more siloed than ever. But I know that that's still a work in progress. My I still, you know, stand on what I said. The other thing, the only other point I would make um, is, you know, when I look at what we're evaluating versus what we're recruiting, um, I, I just think that that list is is flip flop. Those seem like things that we need to do versus things that we'd like to try to get better at. Um, so that's that's the only thoughts I have. Thank you. Mr. Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I too have some concerns and I, I do understand uh, what we were looking at as far as communication gaps uh, from the outside uh, at that point looking in. Um, and and I, I believe that it was more of a uh, uh, tenor of, of how we we're communicating or how we we're marketing to our residents. And, um, and I do agree that we, um, have to always find as many ways as possible to listen to what our residents are saying, but um, we cannot um, at this time validate additional hires uh, that, that roll outside what we would consider as a core service, um, uh, reserve or no reserve. I, th I think we have to set a good precedence uh, in the city here as far as how our money is spent. So that's my comment. Thank you. Ms. Smith. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is a interesting um, topic for me because my background is in communication and uh, part of my run for council was better communication. And so with having four communication positions. Uh, I understand the value that true communication can bring to um, any organization. Uh, it brings accountability, it brings transparency, uh, but much to uh, what both of my colleagues have mentioned before, uh, it is not a core service that provides uh, the 
ability to have drinking water and uh, safety and provide safe uh, roadways for our residents. Um, so I would have to agree with my colleagues that these positions uh, should not be moving forward as far as uh, getting hires. Um, but I also want to take it a step further and hope that I get uh, some colleague feedback as well as support. I've been asking since uh, I believe it was April or May uh, regarding furloughs. And I know that at that point we said that we are using reserves uh, to accommodate uh, all of our expenses here. And while I can appreciate that, uh, I, I really truly, um, and while this is ex extremely hard um, as a policymaker to say we, sh we should look at furloughs, um, it's not an easy decision to do. Um, so what I would like Mr. Tripp is to have an understanding of how much furloughs would save us in the long run. Um, and I mean long run as in just two weeks, I would like um, to know from staff uh, what that would look like as far as uh, a sa cost savings uh, for a one uh, paycheck cycle um, on what that would look like for the, the savings of um, where we're at with our budget. So if we could add that um, to the list, I know it takes um, my colleagues supporting that um, and I'm not asking for it to be uh, looked at to support a furlough. I would just like the information on how much the cost savings for all of our employees combined would be for uh, furloughs um, and that's top down uh, for what that would cost us. Um, so that's I think much to what uh, our residents that called in tonight um, specifically uh, Ms. True's point that we have not looked at even furloughs. Um, so I would like to uh, add that as an action item um, to be discussed um, and maybe not now, but uh, maybe in our upcoming policy and budget meeting uh, in September. So I hope I got uh, some support. Um, thank you. Other comments from council? Mayor, I'll respond to Councillor Smith's question. We'll get that, uh, Councillor Smith, and we'll uh, provide that either in advance or on September 19th. And just to be clear, you're asking for a two-week, our, our estimate of what the dollar amount would be of a two-week furlough for all employees. Um, there are something around between 1,000 and 1,100 um, uh, full-time equivalent permanent people, and then there are uh, seasonally, this time of year, maybe another six or 800 part-time. and so. We'll provide all of that uh, in that total. I, I do want to point something out. Um, please don't assume that because we haven't talked about furloughs, we haven't worked on that as an option internally, because we have. Um, to start to push out that kind of information in the workforce, furloughs and layoffs and that sort of thing um, can be really challenging, can be um, a concerning, uh, difficult thing and it was in my judgment that along the way we needed to be looking at all, what all options were and I've told employees this that we would study this and we'd have those numbers in hand but we haven't been apparent about producing or presenting that um, until we needed to do that and um, we're, we're getting closer to the point where those numbers um, expenses and revenues need to balance for you and what we present on September 19th but um, if we can get that, which I'm quite certain we can, or at least a close estimate, we'll provide that to you in advance at your request. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Tripp. If that um, is something that your team has been working on, I, I would pr definitely prefer it uh, before uh, our budget uh, meeting in September. I believe it is September 19th. Um, that way we have a little bit of time to digest it and look at uh, all of the possibilities that are coming in. I would, I would greatly appreciate that. We'll be glad to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeMont. And just to follow up on Councillor Smith, if we could have that data broke out so we could see it between departments so that we could um, try to delineate between core service positions and those that aren't necessarily um, vital. Thank you. Ms. Seitz. 
I have a follow up question actually real quick to Councillor DeMont. Are you talking about for um, furloughs, you want to look at it on a department basis or were you like as an amendment to Councillor Smith's request or in addition? Um, as part of her request, it would nice be able to be able to see that because some some things are, you know, core services that we expect to run all the time. So I'd like to be able to understand our options. Um, yeah, thank you both. Um, so I, you know, I, I agree. We've, we've asked um, since our, our strategic plan and, and budget retreat, we definitely want to see things on both sides of the ledger. Um, how, do, how do we um, shrink the gap? Um, and so I do think that um, looking at all options um, and having some staff recommendations will be helpful. Um, so, you know, I, I support um, looking at what do furloughs do, what do, but also what do um, program changes um, looking operationally, programmatically, um, you know, with a scalpel. Um, and I'm, I'm imagining you were already planning on giving us those recommendations for the September 19th meeting. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I, I am supportive of, of having all of that data. And I agree it is going to be a lot for us as a council to digest. You know, we have some hard days ahead of us that are we're going to have to make some hard choices. Um, so I, I do understand kind of the the heartburn um, on adding new positions, um, you know, with so so little um, understanding of what the new normal looks like. What do our revenue streams look like, um, and what are the highest and most pressing needs of our of our organization? Um, you mentioned earlier that two of these have are already in the recruitment process. Which two of the four positions here listed are already in the recruitment process? I'll call, excuse me, I'll call on Deputy City Manager. Excuse me. Andrews, if you would, Jody, handle that question. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Tripp. Uh, Jody Andrews, Deputy City Manager. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question, uh, Councillor. That's an excellent question, and then I can also provide uh, the full status of the six vacant positions in the uh, in Innovation and Communication Division. I think that might be helpful just for clarity. There are two positions uh, that have been posted, and those postings have now closed and are, have moved into the interview process. That the first one of those two is the Communication and Marketing Officer position. The second of those two is a digital media specialist position. So those two positions were posted, uh, the postings have closed and they are now in the um, interview process of, of the recruitment. There are two uh, more positions that had been uh, identified as moving forward as well. Those have not yet been posted uh, in light of the discussion uh, raised uh, by Councillor DeMott on this issue. Uh, um, either of these two positions uh, at this time. Uh, the, the, that, those two positions are the lead graphic designer that was ready to post. We've held on that. Uh, the, the next one is the vi videographer position or, or um, videographer specialist. We've also held on that posting. The, the next two positions to comprise the six were frozen um, as part of the COVID response. Um, and those two positions are uh, the second digital media specialist and an administrative assist assistant position. So those are the six positions. In recap, uh, two have posted and closed, uh, two have been frozen, and two um, we've paused on pending uh, this discussion uh, with City Council. Can we look at the next slide? Wasn't there a list of all of the different frozen positions? Okay, this is, this is helpful for me to review really quickly. Um, thank you. I'm going to... Um, defer further comments till I hear from some of my colleagues, but um, definitely I, I hope staff and, and residents listening hear um, how judicious this council wants to be on how we're spending money um, and, and obligating ourselves to new liabilities in light of, of the recession and really wanting to make sure that each position that is filled is filling a, a, a really important niche. Um, we trust our city manager and our city staff to assess what they think they need based off of city council's direction. 
um, to do their job, um, but we also have to recognize these are different times and, and this is a role of council to approve our our, um, our budget. So that's that's why this kind of conversation is happening right now. Mr. Voles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> yeah, I also was, uh, I guess, one of the counselors who had initially a couple of weeks ago requested a more in-depth discussion here. And, you know, I think we're in a position where I think I, well, I associate myself with comments made earlier. I, we're going to be asked soon, I'm afraid, to, uh, I fear that we'll be asked to make some really tough decisions. I think hiring up right now might not be send the right message. I think it's it's not my decision to hire or not, but I guess my request would be we, might, we have to be as strategic as we can be on the positions we fill. I feel like we're, uh, we're we will be in a in a time frame where we're going to make tough decisions. We uh, you know, just tonight we voted to delay the budget until October just to get more information about where we are, where our finances are. I would just ask that maybe for some of these positions, if they're not critical and they're not part of our core services and it's not public safety or a core function of city government right now, maybe we hold off until we are absolutely sure that we have all the proper resources to take care of our current staff and our current staffing level and, and help those people. But then also, um, so I would just ask that we keep that in mind. I, I personally right now would not support hiring up. I realize how important communications is. Um, I have also a communications background. I know we've had some people be uh, placed in the, the departments who can communicate with residents, but I would have to say right now, not knowing exactly where we're headed fiscally and what our finances will be, I would say as much as possible, let's not hire up. So that would just be my request, um, but that's not my call exactly until it comes to budget time. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Ms. Gully. Mr. Mayor, um, I would like to concur with um, Councillor Sites. I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Sites and Councillor Vols. Um, hiring up doesn't seem like a really great thing to be doing at this time. Um, it it seems like we need to take some precaution and maybe pull back a little bit. Um, I I also would like to see the um, the breakout of the furloughs, but. I would like to know specifically what one day of furlough actually saves us. Um, I know that the schools and the, the state government and the federal government have all done some furloughs. Um, I believe that a lot of the public schools are doing one per quarter. Um, that seems to be a good option. So I would like to see a breakdown of it per day, not necessarily by weeks. Um, and then also, and I'm, and I'm sorry, Councillor Smith, if I misinterpreted that, but that was what I heard. Um, and then. Also, um, I really like the idea of seeing a breakdown of department um, programming that we might be able to curb or cut a little bit that might help us. Um, I think that it's really important that we balance our budget. We make sure that we are putting, that we have money, um, that we're not going into debt, that we're working really hard as a city to stay um, in good standing with our with our own budget so um i would agree I, I look forward to this conversation on september 19th but i i appreciate everything that was said by my fellow counselors tonight i, I think there there's been some really good thought other comments from council mr tripp i look at you as the city manager and working with your department heads and I expect you to do strategic positioning on the jobs that you feel are important to the city to meet our goals and objectives and stay within the, the, your authorized budget. Some of these uh, may seem like they're not uh, as high a level as others. I know that we tend to talk about certain groups more so than others, but I think that we also have to look at what do we need to do to keep the city running. So I expect you to do just what we hired you to do is make those hard decisions. Moving on next, uh, I think that finished everything on the COVID update. Am I correct, Mr. Tripp? Yes, Mr. Mayor, that's right. All right, let's move on to the next item. This is the uh, city manager's report. And before we Mr. head there. Yes. Mr. Mayor, this is Barbara Opie. I apologize. There was a request to discuss city camera protocols. 
Okay. Um, and in person oh, yeah, meetings. I you left. <laughs> no, I'm here. I just apologize. Okay. I just want to make sure we don't okay. miss that item that was requested. Okay. Go ahead then, Ms. Opie. Actually, I'm going to ask Ms. Parker to lead this, the in, in, initial part of this conversation, please. Okay. Ms. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as uh, Deputy City Manager Barbara Opie mentioned, we did have a request to discuss the City Council camera protocols. Um, and just very briefly, I'll give you a, a quick um, rundown of where we've been, how we came to our current protocols um, when we moved to our virtual City Council meetings way back in March. Um, when we first uh, began holding our virtual City Council meetings, um, after some research, the GoTo webinar platform was chosen because of its ability to host large numbers of people in the audience, um, as well as panelists and accommodate staff who have presentations to make to council. Um, however, one of the limitations of the solution was that only six active cameras could be shared with an audience at any given time. Um, and we um, made our council protocols um, mirror that limitation accordingly um, when council approved them, I believe in late March. However, moving forward, um, the GoToWebinar platform released an upgrade to their software, which was mentioned to you all last week during your pre-meeting system check that will now accommodate um, the entire seven members of our city council to be visible during a meeting, as well as still having our visuals for the audience to follow along with our agenda as we go through city business. Um, Councilor Seymour specifically made a request to discuss this item and um, stated that his preference would be to have all of council on camera um, if we aren't in person. And so with that summary, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Mayor and council to discuss um, as you wish. Question I had based on what you just said, and I think Mr. Seymour will come up uh, secondly. That would allow all seven council members to be on the screen at one time. Does that go away when presentations are being presented? No, sir. So you are correct. You, We do now have the capacity to share all seven of city council's cameras um during presentations as well and you would still have the slides visible to the audience as well as to council um during any type of presentation okay i kind of thought that's where you were saying but i wanted to be sure mr seymour you have a comment or a question thank you mr mayor um yeah and i i i greatly appreciate that uh, my my request was fast tracked through here um city manager's office and then uh, city city clerk uh, Parker, um, with with the new technology uh, that was brought to us last week, um, I was hoping that uh, now that we can get all seven of us on us here, it's it's short of being there in person, but I think it would add to our discussion and focus, and I think it would um, um, increase the public's transparency about our discussion too. So that that was my thoughts on that. Um, it is uh, something that most of us have gotten used to on other meeting platforms um, being present, and um, you know the 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 seven of us. Uh, it's not a, it's not one of those Hollywood square, squares Zoom meetings where it's several pages either. So um, it it would be more manageable, uh, but I think it it would would help our communication and it it would help us uh, help us focus too. So I I appreciate that opportunity to share what my thoughts were. All right, sir. Ms. Scully? I would like to support um, Councillor Seymour's proposal of, of putting all of us on screen, but I'd like to add to it. Um, I would really like to see whoever is presenting and talking also be on the screen, typically a staff member. Um, it helps me to see the person on the screen talking while they're doing a presentation. So I would also like to add that if we could. Ms. Scully, I think the comment was when the presentation's up on the screen, you will not see cameras. Is that correct, Ms. Parker? Well, no, sir. You would be able to see all seven cameras and it would, 
basically look like a banner at the top. Of course, there are different configurations um, that can be accommodated, and I probably have to turn that over to Matt Williams um, to see if he's played with it a little bit more. You certainly do have um, some configurability with this moving forward, but um, we would be able to, similar to the view that you have right now with, you can see Counselor Scully sharing her camera. You can also see the um, agenda item slide. What would happen is, that top banner would fill with all of the cameras being um, displayed at the, at the same time. And of course, the more cameras that you add to it, the smaller, you know, that it's gonna fit them in, um, but, but certainly all seven would fit at one time. Um, and then of course, you know, there is an option, and this, these are your protocols, these are your, uh, this is your call completely, um, that you could, during discussion, turn off the slide, show only cameras. I mean, there's a multiple different ways that we could configure this to council's liking, um, depending on how you want to communicate out to the public who are joining us um, and how you want to communicate with each other and with staff. And, and okay. maybe Thank not maybe not during the presentation, but certainly when we ask questions, to have um, staff be able to pull up their camera and make themselves visual, I think would help greatly. I don't I don't know how you work it. I, I know you have magic and you will make it work, but just just a thought. Okay, Ms. Dykes. Um, I just wanted to say I supported Councillor Seymour's request. Um, you know, I think it's a good interim step before we get back. Um, and, and hopefully, I mean, all of us want this pandemic to be over and for it to be um, safe for all of us to meet in person and to see our residents eye to eye again. But this does seem like a nice um, interim step. Um, I would also agree with Councillor Scully. I did not recognize how um, impactful it is to have a presenter's camera on um, until we had the um, proposed consultant for the um, water facilitation with her with her camera on and I felt like I really um, did benefit from that and I presume um, whether residents liked it or not it seems like they were more engaged in the conversation with that um, so I do think that there is some benefit to having um, staff if they're willing um, to be on camera as well and I mean we're all working on um, behalf of, of our residents. And I think we all share that goal of wanting to have increased transparency and understanding and clarity um, for the community as a whole. So um, I guess that I, I didn't think I had that preference actually until last week. Mr. DeMott. Um, thank you. I, I agree. I think that it would be a good idea to be able to utilize the cameras better. Um, I don't know what the rules are around it. I mean, every once in a while in any of these meetings, people have to turn their camera off for one reason or another, but I think my preference would be uh, what Councillor Seymour said. Um, as far as staff, I certainly actually am a big proponent of at least our, our employees being on camera um, between the city manager, Dave Frankel, um, when they're talking to us, and it would be nice uh, with the clerks because those are the people we interact with the most. If we could have other staff on there, I do see value in it. Um, I would leave that to city manager Tripp. Um, I know that you know staff is kind of spread out. Maybe some of them don't have situations that is as easy to be able to utilize cameras as, as others. But at a minimum, I would like to see at least our direct reports on camera if possible. Thank you. So let me ask a very uh, telling question. Is there anybody who objects to this request? Ms. Parker, I think you got your answer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I could just clarify uh, one of the comments um, that I heard from a couple of the council members regarding staff members um, who were giving presentations. Um, and then I also heard Councillor DeMott asking at least for the city manager and the city attorney and those who direct report to council. Um, just for the sake of clarity, would council like us to have any staff member during, for example, if there is just discussion item or are you requesting that council or that uh, staff share their cameras only for formal presentations within an item? Ms. Parker, I think the, the request was, if possible, and the staff is willing, when they're doing a presentation that their camera be on, 
while they're presenting. But I think the clarification was that if possible, try to get all seven members of council, the city attorney and the city manager on the screen during the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I will draft an amendment to our current city council meeting protocols um, and be sure to release that to all of council um, as soon as possible. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Ms. Opie, is anything else on item four? Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, there was a uh, also included in Councillor Seymour's request was a discussion on in-person meetings. I'm not sure if there's anything more to discuss at this time or if it's uh, contingent on as we start getting City Hall reopened, which we anticipate having some more information on that later this week. Okay, I think we're, we're trying to get to when you guys have got something ready to recommend to us, along with some timelines of when that might happen, I think is what they're trying to get to. It's, Mr. Seymour, if that's okay with you, we'll hope to have something by the end of the week. Yeah, yes, Mr. Mayor. In in light of our earlier discussion and with some timelines coming up, uh, we can defer that until we have some plans. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Sophie. There being nothing else, uh, Mr. Tripp, we've had a request for a short bio, and uh, we'll take uh, CS9. Let's just call it 942. We'll take a short five. And then we'll come back and be ready for your presentation, sir.
All right, Ms. Parker, let's see if everybody's back. Mayor Atchison. Yeah, I'm here. Councillor DeMont. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Here. Councillor Seymour. Here. Councillor Scully. Here. Councillor Smith. Present. And Councillor Bowles. Here. Okay, Mr. Tripp. I think the action item is yours. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of council. Um, I've got a short, um, just a few page um, PowerPoint. Mr. Williams, would you pull that up, please? Um, the reason for this is that the city manager's uh, annual report <clears throat> is provided to the council traditionally and then through an executive session that we have, um, the review is shared with me and that'll happen later in September. Uh, but there's not necessarily historically always been a public portion to this. Um, and last year, I think for the first time, um, I decided to go ahead and put something on the agenda to let the public know that this report had been issued and provide access to them to the report. Um, because of course the work that we do is for them. And uh, I, I thought that was important. Um, so tonight, I just have a short summary of that, and then uh, our staff will be posting it uh, on, on the city's web. And uh, I look forward to chance to speak with you counselors in September um, about your feelings on it as we move ahead uh, and look at uh, the year in, in, in past, and then also look at the year coming forward. Um, the report covers a, re a reporting period basically from September through August, so starting last September of 2019 through August of 2020. Um, and it's uh, it's structured in a way that's around a, um, a format uh, of eight dimensions that you evaluate of my performance. Next slide, please. So this has been a, <clears throat> this has been an unusual year, obviously. Um, 2020 is probably the most challenging year in recent history to be involved in local government. And I'm somewhat of a qualified person to say that because I've been in local government now for uh, since, since 1978. Um, but it's true not only for staff, it's true for you as counselors. And I just want to express tonight how, how much uh, and the staff and, and I particularly sincerely appreciate and admire your resolve and commitment to the community, particularly th during these trying times. Um, very difficult policy discussion decisions um, and also um, just the format that we meet and, and all of the things that you have to think about. So thank you. Uh, the presentation today will really cover three topics responding to this unprecedented crisis we've had this last year, which is the story of our organization in 19 and 20, maintaining and enhancing city services. And during that time, uh, amazingly enough, there have been a lot of things done that um, advance the city's goals. And then looking towards the future. Next slide, please. So since mid-March, local government is now enduring three events and arguably can be termed, can be termed events of a century. Um, you know, it, it would be one thing to have any one of these events uh, for staff and, and for you as policymakers to be dealing with, but there have been three of them since uh, COVID hit us. Of course, COVID-19, a pandemic unlike we've seen in our lifetimes, dating back uh, to being compared to, to uh, um, a pandemic 100 years ago. An economic crisis that saw our economy essentially overnight collapse around unemployment uh, and, and uncertainty um, and tough decisions uh, between uh, public health and the economy. And of course, even most recently, civil unrest and equity conflict in America. And I would tell you that just prior to me starting my professional career, you know, I was a child of the 60s. And, and uh, just recently, um, I took an opportunity to look at uh, on the Decades Channel, the 1968 uh, Democratic National Convention in Chicago and the Vietnam War protests that went on with that and just you know reflected on um, that era and what the similarities are maybe to, to some of the things we're seeing today. We've experienced record unemployment. We've had unprecedented reductions in business activity, rioting, 
a significant loss of confidence uh, in police across America, unprecedented uncertainty, um, and political acrimony, you know, has, be has been associated with it. So it's been a tough time. Um, any of these events would cause local government to redirect previous plans and attend to that matter. To have all three at the same time, it's remarkable, but I would say not as remarkable as the city of Westminster's resilience and our, has, what has been our ability so far to rise above all of the challenges. Um, COVID-19 public health crisis. Westminster has acted swiftly to protect public health. It's acted in the best interest of our community and our staff, I believe. I believe that we prioritize the continuity of essential city services and actions that we've taken to make sure um, that people are secure and safe and that we're thinking about um, those primary um, sensitive needs that people have in their lives. Staff has de demonstrated increased, has de demonstrated incredible flexibility and professionalism. And I'm, I'm so very proud to work um, with you as policymakers, but uh, also the 2000 employees that deliver the services to our city. In the economic crisis, the economic crisis we face faces like nothing we have ever seen. It is unpredictable, which means we must continue to be adaptable. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have seen folks that have responsibilities um, really have to shift and pivot towards uh, how to make smart, timely financial mover, moves, maneuvers on behalf of the financial sustainability of our city, to make wise investments. Um, difficult decisions have been made and will continue to be made. We talked about some earlier this evening. Um, and believe me, I appreciate the feedback. I, I really do. Um, this is all of our city and, and we've got to find the right answers. Uh, we have an issue of civil unrest that you know was not um, predicted. The, de the death of George Floyd uh, in, a, in a city a long ways away from here set off an outcry for justice and equity across our nation and our local communities. It has brought people together, though, from all walks of life to advocate uh, for the black community. It has brought to light issues of systemic racism in our society that honestly, in my view, have been ignored for too long. And so uh, we are here today with the spotlight on our police departments across the nation. Um, we've, this has resulted in new laws and policies and significant impacts to our police officers. Chief Carlson reported a couple of weeks ago um, you know, we, we highly value our public safety folks in this city, and we're, we're fortunate because our community does. But um, as, you, as you've seen, you know, they feel very threatened, and it, it has become a much more difficult task to police across America, and that, it's not, that is not exclusive of Westminster. The last few months have brought out the best and, unfortunately, some of the worst of humanity. Uh, they have shown me now that more than ever, it's time for us to set aside our own ideas and to listen. We've, we've got to work together. And I hope, we're, you know, I hope that you can look back at the last year and, and that your staff and that I've listened to you. Um, I continue to try to get better at that. These times have shown us more than ever that it's time to be introspective, to ask ourselves how we can be better, how we can be part of the solution. Uh, how can we take this time of these three unbelievable things that have happened and not be discouraged, but to use them as a way to, to band together and to come together? They show me the need to set aside all the things that divide us and come together for the betterment of, betterment of our community and our nation. And that's hard to do. It's really hard to do during difficult times. But I think we need to do that. Westminster prides itself on being a welcoming community. And we can we can do better, you know. That starts with looking at our own organization and what we can do. We have three related initiative underway, initiatives underway that were started this year that I'm really proud of. First of all, our police department is getting out in the community and listening and primarily to listen to those that have complaints, that have concerns. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. That's not happening in a lot of places, but our police department has taken this very seriously. They're listening to people that have concerns that have ideas for how to get, how to get better. They are evaluating how to best train and support our police during these trying times. They're evaluating how to deliver service to the community in the best manner possible. Secondly, our organization uh, will have a third party um, conducting the evaluation of our city practices as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our, our own organization is concerned about it. We've seen additional concerns within the workplace in the last year uh, as to how people interact and relate to each other. We want to become a more diverse workforce. 
I shared with you some data on our makeup. And our makeup does not reflect our community. Um, we've improved in some areas, but we've got a ways to go and we've got to find answers. We want to, we want to be better. We want to better reflect the makeup of our community. We want to be a place where everyone feels welcome, whether an employee, a resident, or a customer. Uh, we want City Hall to be everybody's City Hall. And third, we are developing several initiatives to better engage our community. We are putting the staff and the partnerships in place to improve our two-way communication with those that we serve. In the area of maintaining and enhancing city operations, um, I'm going to take just a minute here. And you know, you have a report that outlines these, but I, I just I want to pick out uh, maybe 15 or 20 that I think are pretty remarkable this year. That I think in a group uh, tell a story outside of these horrific things that have happened that we've been dealing with. We adopted a collective bargaining agreement for the 21, 22 um, years with. Local IAF 2889, again, again did it um, with best practices and did it effectively. Our IT department has, has pivoted uh, to become an IT department that has people working in offices in dozens of locations and the technology's kept up. We've had numerous meetings. Um, you know, they were there for us in picking the right technology that we haven't had some of the issues that other communities have had. I'm really proud of the board and commission work that happened earlier. The staff liaisons with the council developed and implemented an in-person onboarding session in February. Seems like forever ago, but that was a real highlight of the year, I believe. Um, we've worked on embedding innovative thinking into both short-term and long-term organizational plannings by creating I-teams in the organization and have embraced um, improvement in processes within the organization. We developed and initiated the actual first structured continuous improvement program, the Solve Academy Light. You know, some of these things have been overshadowed because we haven't talked about some of these things in great detail, of course, with other things uh, on our mind um, after COVID struck. We're, we're close to completing a sustainability plan. We've completed the public engagement, including three work sessions, and the first draft was provided to council about a month ago, and we'll have a study session on that. Uh, planned in the near future to uh, to bring that conclusion and to have our city's first sustainability plan. General Services is currently leading a cross-departmental public-private partnership initiative to explore possible P3 opportunities through the organization, a way that in that more five-year five -year time frame or so may be a way that we can save money. The police department command staff has been strategizing innovative process modifications. They've been developing community partnerships. And the strategy that I mentioned before really falls into five key components. Communication with the community, training and education of the officers, looking at their supervision and processes, um, looking at their community partnerships, and working on officer mental and emotional health. Staff has established an equity action team within the organization to initially focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion within our organization. The city this year hired our first homelessness navigator in March of 2020 to better serve people experiencing homelessness, uh, particularly those folks uh, who are disproportionately part of um, endangered communities and underserved populations. Just as a side note, we, we pivoted our park and rec department and assisted growing home with getting food out to community. Um, and yes, we kept some of those folks on payroll during that time, but we used them, I think, really effective in the city. And I really appreciate and want to point out what all of the departments have done to work cross-functionally and to support each other during this time. Since October of last year, 501 employees have attended respectful workplace training in our city. Um, we had uh, have, have done that in the past, but we made a real special effort this last year to, um, to do more of that. Our Public Works Department took possession this year of the water sewer rate model, originally developed by a consultant to continue, and, and they're working to continue to improve that model and our ability to perform analysis. We all know how important that is right now. Utilities Engineering is executing a utilities long-term plan, and, and that plan will help us build out our CIP program uh, as has been presented to you previously, 
And I want to thank you so much for agreeing uh, to go back through that plan with us and to walk uh, down the road with us um, together, having all the same information so you can have viable input as we move forward on the plan. The finance and public um, and, and the policy and budget department have worked together for the COVID Chronicle. Um, someone commented about that earlier tonight. Fire and PD have worked together to build a new 911 communication system. The police department has added two co-responders in the department for services in the community on mental health. Our economic development department, Westy Rise Business Grant, Westy Rise and Dine Grant, PPE for Businesses, Westy Rise of Above Housing Assistance Grant, a small business stabilization grant, and tenant-based rental assistance, all done in the last three and a half months. We've built 440 or have underway 440 affordable housing units in our city, places where people can afford to live that have not had, that have been living many of them through substandard housing. We have many uh, conservation initiatives going on, the development of a fleet electrification program um, for our fleet and a reduced energy district in downtown Westminster. So, you know, that's those, those are a few of several dozen things that have happened this year that are aside from the three issues that I spoke of before. As we move to the future, our city will be known, I believe, for build, for listening, for building bridges. And when you think about these things that are happening to us right now, and I've been through, you know, some catastrophic change and organizational disrupt and like disruption, I can tell you one of the things that sticks with me is there's there are always those things that 10 years from now, you know, we'll say, gosh, I didn't, we didn't know that then. I really think that we're, um, working towards amplifying diverse voices in our community and reaching out to people in new ways. I think we're working to be better informed and to, what we're talking about tonight with communications is to have a more strategic and engaging communication program. We're looking for new ways to do business. You know, we're looking for what can we do differently in the future than we've done in the past and how do we use this time to, be, to become better as a city. It all starts with uh, and ends with communication and cooperation. And what I'd ask of you is that we all remember and we all work together to know that um, in order for Westminster to be the best it can be, we've got to work together. Um, it's important for the staff and the mayor and council to work as a trusting, supportive team, especially now. Um, it's my pleasure to be in this uh, role. I, I, I honor it and I thank you for everything that you've done. and. Um, when we meet in, in a month or so to talk about your thoughts on, on this year and moving forward, I'll be anxious to have that conversation. Thank you for the time this evening. Thank you, Mr. Tripp. Do you have any other items you want to cover tonight? I don't, Mayor. Thanks for your time this evening. Okay. Ms. Decker, are you still with us? Good evening, Mr. Mayor. We yes, have a request here. for an executive session. Can you help lead us into that, please? I can. Um, we have a request for an executive session for the discussion of a personnel matter regarding the presiding judge's performance evaluation pursuant to Westminster Municipal Code Section 111.3c1 and Colorado Revised Statute Section 246.402.4f. Council, we have had a request to enter into an executive session as defined by Acting City Attorney Ms. Decker, at this time, I will ask each member of the council to confirm that they are prepared to go into the executive session. Mr. DeMont. Um, just prior to us doing that, do we want to extend now so we don't have to come out? All right, we've got an hour. Okay, now I'm good. Ms. Seitz? Yes. Mr. Seymour? Agree. Ms. Scully? Yes. Mr. Bowles? Yes. And Ms. Smith? Yes. Okay. Mayor also. Uh, we are currently at 10.06 and we will convene uh, in the next, at 5, at 10.11, we will convene an executive session. Reminder of the council that you have to log out of your webcast go to your meeting invite, it's a new link there for you, and remember you have to use the password to get in there. At this point, uh, we are adjourned, we'll reconvene shortly in the executive session. <laughs>